the reason this is so scary because it's an existential problem. If we love art, right? And we did it for our whole lives. And suddenly there's a technology that makes what we've done our whole lives uh, pointless, meaning we it could be done in one second. Then we're stuck with the hor horrific burden of wondering, well, then what was the point of our whole lives? Or bigger, what is the point of anything, right? So for humans looking at this, it's very scary for humans because, you know, except for some people who have really strong faith, or maybe a lot of people do, we kind of don't know what the point of anything is. And so we make do with living our lives and doing things we enjoy and that we love. And if you find out that a robot just decimated you forever uh, in the thing that you love most and a robot does it better than you, it's like, it's very tough to stomach. G'day and welcome to another episode of the Andrew Price Podcast, the podcast for serious artists, where we talk about habits, techniques, and tricks to improve your mindset. Uh, in this episode, I am joined with Shadi Safadi, who is an art director and founder of One Pixel Brush, which is a studio that hires 40 concept artists to create many of the ideas that you see in uh, a lot of popular IP. Um, so most notably, they worked on Last of Us Part 2. We talk about that. Um, and Shadi uh, also has a pretty viral talk online called Concept Art is Dead, which he did at GDC. Always a fun listen. So without further ado, here is Shadi. All right, Shadi. Hi. In your own words. Yes. Do you want to tell us uh, who are you? So I'm Shadi Safadi. Uh, so yeah, I got into concept art... Um uh, you know, I went to art school when there wasn't concept art, meaning like the, green, the games didn't have graphics good enough to need a dedicated concept artist. This was like Super Nintendo days. Wow. Yeah. I think I graduated college in like 2003 and uh, I went to Art Center College of Design. Um, I don't recommend going to an expensive art school now, but at the time that was kind of the only way. Um, and if I wasn't, I wasn't super motivated, but if you are motivated, I would say um, there's so much information online that's better than the information you're going to get from an art school. It's just that... The only thing you need to, you know, pull yourself up and manage is the uh, is the art community because you really need like a dream team. You need like other colleagues who you can always send stuff to and bounce things off of. You need like minded people. And so school sometimes hands you that. But if you can get that, if you can build an art community of like people who are all in the same wavelength and want to grow the same as you, uh, then, yeah, I don't know about art school, especially not at the cost it is at Art Center. But yeah, I went to Art Center and then I graduated. I've told the story in interviews before, so I'll keep it brief. But I, you know, couldn't get a job out of school. Worked in a restaurant in my hometown because my portfolio sucked, and I was uh, a shitty egomaniac. You can be, you can be Kanye, but you better be good. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, true. So I was, I, I was, I was more egotistical and way worse. Now I'm slightly less egotistical and and slightly better. Okay, so okay. The two have balanced out, but. You, you can't afford to be as bad as I was and think you're hot shit. But, you know, like I think in school, in college or in high school, all young people feel this way. And I see I walk around Prague, too, and I see these kids and like who are young artists or artsy types. Right. They're hanging out, smoking cigarettes by the cafe and, and you know, and, and, and wearing artsy clothes. I used to wear like Jinko pants and. Oh, and yeah, uh, nice. And uh, I used to have a choker, a choker necklace made of hemp oh, that had like yeah. little steel balls in it. Oh, dude, rocking! Yeah, I uh, remember Jinko. There was like huge cartoon character on my pants. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. So those, so those kids, like you know, when you're young and you're into art, it's all you have, mm. and your whole identity is wrapped yes. in it, and you suck at it. And if you do suck at it, your whole identity is wrapped in that, yeah. and that's normal because you're discovering who you are. So I was very insecure and very like um, identified with myself as an artist. I mean, we're all insecure, no matter how good you are. Mm. Um, you're always a little bit insecure, but when that's kind of all you have in the world, it feels really delicate and tenuous. So I, I had a hard time learning. Uh, I needed to go to art school. I needed to mature before uh, I started learning how to learn, mm. before I started saying, that awesome art is not a threat to me. You know, that amazing art is not a threat because we all still feel this way a little bit. You see something that is, especially in concept art, you see someone do something amazing and you go through this range of emotions and the first one is just like, ah, fuck, damn it. And then you get sad and then you're inspired and then you're like depressed. It's like this whole cycle. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, now, now I just go through it faster and I get to the part where I'm like, what can I learn from this person? <laughs> or I push down the part that's like upset because of how good this is and take a deep breath 
and just try to see what I can learn. And the cool thing you realize after some time is that sometimes you look at a piece of art that you used to think was amazing, and five years later, you still like it, but it's not wowing you anymore. Mm. And the reason that is, is because you got better. Yeah. And subtly, all your tastes changed. Yes. And you would still think it was mind-blowing if you didn't get so good. Yes. But now you've gotten so much better that you look back on that stuff and you're like, it's, it's decent. You know? Yes. Yes. That's right. A, a deeper understanding of the topic. You can also like see where they've cheated or that they don't understand something. And it's, yeah. 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 Or their light and color or their subtlety or something about the way they work is not what you, uh, not what you would do now. And, and that's the interesting thing about art. From the concept art is dead talk, something I realized. And I tried to preface it by saying, hey, this is only for AAA. This is only for me. This is my taste. And I'm talking about my taste as if it's fact because I think that's fair. Yeah. Uh, in art school, there was a lot of teachers that talked about their their artistic opinion as if it was fact, but they didn't give the caveat that this is my opinion. And I think in mm -hmm. art, when you're climbing that mountain, like I was showing in the concept art is dead thing, when you're climbing that mountain, you're choosing the mountain you wanna climb. So, um, you know, you're deciding what road you wanna go down and you get to de you get to decide what's good for you. You get to like and not like what you like. Mm. And it's important that you embrace that. Mm. Um, I think, you know, maybe people sometimes are scared to say, or, you know, or something popular comes out that you don't like. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend shitting on anything publicly, but certainly among your close circle of friends who you trust, who are other artists, I think it's really good to shit on stuff and to say what's good and to have conversations about what you like and don't like mm -hmm. and, and have them be very frank and open and not just say, you know, I've been to like, you know, animation studios where I ask someone there who like, you know, who's really into the profession, maybe like, what's your favorite, you know, animated movie and they'll they'll say like Pinocchio and I'm like oh really like you haven't you felt like you had to say one that no you know that society can't disagree with you on <laughs> yeah that's right something so you ridiculous. know it's like well something that's in the canon yeah. you know it's like it's it's already decided yeah like yeah. I I loved this the last blue sky animated movie a spies in disguise was amazing it was just hilarious will smith before the slap tom holland <laughs> really funny dialogue really great gags just genuinely like fun and funny the what's, whole time what's the movie sorry blue and, sky uh, it's called spy spies in disguise oh okay it's an animated movie okay. and it was made by a studio uh called blue sky which is an animation studio that was the last movie they made and then oh, i don't know why yeah. but you know they, they, shut down. they went i remember that they, they got dispersed yeah they shut down but the movie was was incredible and and you know, and if I'm talking in casual conversation, and I say I loved Spies in Disguise and and Storks, like, and even Trolls wasn't bad because I love animation. <laughs> um, it's risky. I feel scared. You know, I feel like someone's going to be like, "What, dude?" I'm like, "Listen, I like Nemo and Ratatouille, also. Yeah, like, yeah, the classic. I like a range of yeah. things. By the way, Storks, I, and I also like totally The Revenant. Agree, you know, that's 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 really good. That is so underrated as an animated movie. It's funny. It's really funny. It's funny. There's a scene with the wolves where they lick yeah. the baby. It's funny. It's the gags in that. They're like really solid gags and they're coming at you like every few seconds. It's very underrated. More yeah. Should, people should watch it. And Andy Sandberg is like a natural born actor. Like he's a naturally funny person and so is Will Smith and Tom Holland. So when the actors have their natural banter, mm -hmm. uh, it really works. Surf's Up was like this too. Surf's Up had like really good natural banter. And, and the reason I'm talking so much about animation is because most people know me as like, you know, concept art, art director, but the thing that we're starting to do is we're starting a small animation division to do animated shorts because that's been my passion oh. for a while. And Hell yeah. Yeah, and storytelling is is really fun. So in the last six months, um, I've been you know sort of putting the pieces together, working on, on an animatic. Um, and for those of you who don't know, an animatic is basically where you draw little storyboards, basically, but you put them in some sort of film program. You make them like come after each other. You can add sound to it. You can add, you know, you can even, but you can do it all in Photoshop amazingly. I just found out like six months ago that Photoshop has a whole animation oh, system. Yeah. <laughs> it has yeah. an animation timeline. <laughs> you can do frame by frame animation in Photoshop. It's made for it. You can even add audio. It's 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 incredible. And I've been using the program for 15 years. But I never people knew. will kill me if I, if I don't but, ask uh, why are you not using Blender for that? Grease pencil. 
I probably should be. <laughs> Someone said grease pencil to me a few times. Dude, it's really I literally good. probably yeah. just didn't sit down to look at the watch the tutorial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. I'll do that yeah. tomorrow. Because it's it, and you like okay. you can draw in three D and it's you got onion skinning. You got a you bunch can draw in three D. You can create the environment. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's really cool. Okay, but anyway. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to probably switch to Blender. No, the, t the tools are moving so fast. And, and because I was already drawing the boards in Photoshop, I tried to figure out a way to make it go to uh, Premiere or uh, you know one of the Adobe uh -huh. film programs. But the timeline from stupid Photoshop doesn't translate for some reason. It's like, nice. it's annoying. But uh, I know Alberto Mieglo, who you guys might know from the Love, Death, Robot mm -hmm. series, who made you know uh, a short in the first series called The Witness and a short in the most recent one called Jabaro. For, I know he uses Blender in general, but I don't know about um, for his storyboarding. I think he might. And then Premiere with it, too. Damn. I, I um, this guy. But, yeah, <laughs> you, you have to. I think, yeah, I think, I think the Jabaro, if you guys haven't seen it, I thought that that was like the best thing I'd ever seen in my life that's ever been done in any medium for anything. And I don't want to oh, wow. exaggerate. Oh. I just, I just, I just don't know. And I can, and, and, and I like, I, I like other people and everyone to just feel how you feel. You know, I watch that and I want to be cool and be like, whatever, like I, I'm getting, I want to get into animation, but that, you know, sometimes you see a piece of art where you're like, I don't have, the humanity to make that like mm. whatever's going on inside that guy inside his soul is different than what's going on in mine and mm -hmm. he dug into what he loves what he cares about and this idea of this i don't know if you saw it but oh yes yeah it was the idea of this like really toxic relationship um mm -hmm. and that he explained in an interview but that's what he's drawn to he's drawn to like dangerous um, romantic situations, mm. uh, if you will, and he mm -hmm. and the passion involved in the in the forbidden, um, mm -hmm. and it was so beautiful and dark, and it was such a good. Uh, the characters were such an exaggerated version of telling that nugget that was really true to who he is. Mm -hmm. But that's mm -hmm. not who I am, you know. I I'm not drawn to that, you know, that way. I, I don't like see. Oh my God, this. There's so much drama here in this relationship. I'm so drawn to it because of that. I'm just like, why would I want to deal with that? I want to go do art and go see some mountains that are beautiful. Yeah, you know, yeah, like yeah. I don't live in the same world as him. And I think that's like awesome. What was so awesome about it and what makes art so good is that everyone gets to tap into the thing that's truest to them yes. and try to express that. That is if they're telling stories. Um, mm. With concept art, it, you, you're 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 interpreting someone else's story and you're trying to visualize it. So yeah. you don't necessarily you tap into your artistic taste, but you don't necessarily need to tap into like necessarily who you are as a person. But that's why I think it's natural to want to transition from concept art mainly to telling a story and trying to do it visually because that's mm -hmm. kind of an evolution of 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 doing it for others for a long time relatively well. I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So okay, so go, going back a little bit, so you because you, you mentioned briefly you 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 had very um, high 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 tastes and your your identity was wrapped up in art. How did you? Yeah, maybe tell us like how did you end up getting your first job, uh, or how did you progress? I got my. My first job at Idle, uh, you know, I worked in a restaurant for a year and just worked on my portfolio, and I went to San Jose State uh, Community College. Um, okay. I went to community college, West Valley, then San Jose State, and I took art classes and worked on my portfolio. Got into Art Center eventually from a year of trying because it was the one school that rejected me. So I'm like, I'm going there. Okay. Uh, and then I went I, when I finished. When I finished, I worked in a restaurant in my hometown, which was the worst time of my life. Really sad. Uh, and then uh, I got a job at a small studio in Colorado called Idle Minds, and we worked on a Neopets game, PlayStation Two game okay. called Neopets, which were like Pokemon kind of at that time. The game didn't do that well, um, so they let a lot of people go. And I had a friend at Naughty Dog that I met at GDC, this guy named Richard LaMartian. He's great. And he, uh, I had a connection with him because I went to GDC and I was a super fanboy. And Richard was like, he was the kind of person, and he's still this kind of person, who's like nice to noobs for no reason. Oh, nice. Except for he's just a good person. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. Like if yeah, someone yeah. comes up to him and is like, oh, my God, you work at Naughty Dog. He's like, yeah, I do. What can I help you with? He's just. Oh, he's like a nice. good person yeah yeah, yeah in that nice. regard 
So I became friendly with him, and and they did an art test. I did. They had an opening for a game. I didn't know what it was. It turned out to be Uncharted, but I didn't. Oh. Uncharted one. Wow. Uh, I didn't know what it was. I did the art test, and I failed it. Uh-huh. Uh, the art director <laughs> at the time was like, "Nah, it's not that good." But uh, I and thought it was you, good. You I thought it was the best for thing a I'd ever done. Art position. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I thought it was the best thing I'd ever done. And then, uh, and then they said, but we have this other game. It's a Jack and Daxter PSP game, if you remember the PSP. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was more car- cartoony, and it was more suited to what I did, which is cartoony style. You know, my illustration wasn't realistic enough, which is why in the concept art is dead thing, where it's talking about realism, realism, and, ever- and, and some people, you know, get their, their pants in a twist over it. It's because I went through this whole journey where I was doing stuff that was really stylized, and they asked me to work on Uncharted. Uh, because after about, I think, a month working, they hired me to work on this other sort of stylized game. They didn't hire me for Uncharted, but they hired me for this Jack and Daxter PSP game that had, like, airships and stuff. And and I was, like, really excited because that's way more in my wheelhouse anyway. Uh-huh. But then that game got canceled or maybe it got shipped off. I don't know what happened. It got stopped. And they said, all right, well, you can either leave or you can go work on Uncharted. And I said, fine, I'll work on Uncharted. And I was just miserable. I really? hated it because I went, yeah, I went through the whole thing. It seems it seems normal now, but I was exactly like the people writing angry comments on Concept Art is Dead Talk. I was them <laughs> exactly. I was like, I hate this shit. I don't want to draw plants. You can just take a picture of a plant. Like, why do you need a concept mm-hmm. artist? Mm-hmm. And I right. hated it, but I couldn't quit. And I thought photo bashing looked like shit. Uh, it just looked bad. And then, I've said this before in talks, but Mache Kusiara came. He was a great concept artist, and he did photo bashing in a way that looked good. And I was mm. like, oh. Because making photo bashing uh, look good requires a really sensitive eye to the fidelity of the photo. So uh, if the photo's too sharp, you have to blur it and match it with this grass photo that's a little bit too blurry, and you might have to sharpen it. And that tiny bit of sharpness blur, because all photos have a tiny bit of blur to them, Okay. That yeah. real subtle matching the blurring and the sharpness, when you do it really good, it all looks amazing. And then mm-hmm. if you know the light and the color enough, like you understand it from almost a matte painting perspective level, you understand how to make the lighting maybe the right blue, like the blue of the grass needs to match the blue of the mountain. So if you can match that and you can match the sharpness, which Mache could do really well, and he could overpaint a little bit, and then the final picture, you didn't know where the photo started or the painting began, you, you couldn't see what was what. And wow. suddenly, the magic trick worked for me. And after I saw that, I was like, okay, I, that, I get it now, and we can do this now. Right, okay, okay. And that, and so so you were on board with the photo bashing. So maybe uh, you've mentioned Concept Art is Dead. That's a, a, a talk on YouTube you guys can watch. Uh, but maybe for those who haven't seen it, could you just, what, what, why is Concept Art Dead? Well, in that talk, I was basically making an incendiary title, just clickbaity on purpose. Um, but it was to say that some of the some of the approaches of concept art, which was people starting at the bottom and climbing one ladder step at a time and finding their own way, wasn't the most effective way to get to really good. Okay. Whatever really good means. But like to get to like where the professionals are hiring you. And one of the best examples I gave was in that talk was John Sweeney, who was a graduate from Otis with an okay portfolio, I would say mediocre, and then he went on to art direct Last of Us 2, and I think is probably right. visually the most responsible for the look of that game, one of the best looking games ever. Um, yeah. He has a lot of personal love for film and cinema, and that's something that I can talk about with you and show you some examples too. Yeah. Um, but his eye for film and cinema and lighting and color is really attuned, and he climbed that ladder because when he was starting out, he was taking advice from me and Eitan, Zana, my friends, and he was not, he didn't have an ego about learning from others. And if you can just see where someone went and follow them there, you can get to where they are really quickly. Now, it doesn't mean that you are copying them. Mm -hmm. It just means you are following them through the forest or up the mountain. And that was what the point of the talk was. A lot of people got very upset because they feel like art is is a discovery. You know, it's a it's a it's a wander through the forest and find who you are, you mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. and that's fair for some people. You can yeah. do that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think you can do that. I was just saying it doesn't have to be like that. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of people 
realize that that could be true that okay you see this other artist they spent 10 years getting that good that absolutely does not mean that you need to spend 10 years getting that yes. good because they already did it so just do exactly what they did and you'll skip about nine of those years yes it's unfortunate <laughs> yeah. I, know, I know you know I mean. like i learned i learned from you you know how long it would have taken me to learn blender if I didn't have the donut. <laughs> right. Do you know how much impact that right. fucking donut has had on uh, the entire art world? Like, that program, 3D software is an absolute nightmare for mm. anybody. It's mm -hmm. just, especially from zero. Like, Blender is more user-friendly, sure, than some of the other ones. But still, oh, yeah. um, I just did a workshop for the ADGs, the Art Directors Guild. And uh, a lot of those people were, like, uh, production designers or set designers, people that had no 3D experience at all. And we spent like 20 minutes on the windows, how to open them, how to size them, how to make them go away, how to make new ones. You know, in Blender, any window can be any window. Oh, right, the sub windows, and right, yeah, the modular the versus sub -windows. Not modular, yeah, I know what you mean, yeah. Yes, any window can be any window. And if you know that, and you know how to make any window any window, like the world is, you're not terrified of the program. But if you don't know that, every little wrong step makes something go away and you're like, it went away, how do I get it back? And oh, interesting. you don't think about how basic, Oh shit. you don't think about how basic of a thing, but if you don't understand like the architecture of the program yeah, and how to I make an, a, a gone window come back or replace yes. it with another one, then you're That's like, you're so in fear. You're, you're touching the program with chopsticks because yeah, you're in walking fear. On eggshells. As soon yeah, as you know that, I know. yeah. yeah. I, I, I totally, they, they say it in u usability, like good usability is when a user doesn't feel like they have to tread lightly because they're going to make a mistake that they won't be able to recover from. So you have to make the, yeah. you have to give, give the user confidence so that they can make big steps, mess around, fool about, and it won't destroy, you know, that, that, that they won't be able to, yeah. to come back from. <laughs> and a lot of three, I mean, a lot of applications in general just don't do that. Like everyone's had the experience, no. like even in Photoshop or Premiere, where you change the layout or you hit a button and all the fucking toolbars go away and you're like, what, what? how do I get it back? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you're like pulling out your if phone. If you don't know about the, the F you know? key. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, another incredible reason that Blender became so mainstream in concept art, or at least it is for me and my whole team is because um, we're about 40 artists now and almost all of them use Blender. Wow. Um, one of the reasons besides you is also the just the incredible community online of Very answers solid. like you literally yeah. google yeah you google any arcane tiny question mm -hmm. and most likely it'll come up but i would say too if you're not gonna if you're if you're uh wanting to get into concept art yes watch the tutorial so like jama mm -hmm. uh jurabev has this amazing uh concept art class um a former uh employee uh satish kumar he does a really cool uh, he has a lot, he started a school and he gets really great teachers. Uh, one of them is Leo Aviero, who's a, who's a concept artist that, uh, one of our art directors. Uh, he gets really good artists uh, to do the tutorials. And so if you're looking for a tutorial, that plus you make friends with the people in the class who you think are good, mm. and then you form a little community. And then the next time you have a Blender question, you guys all hop on the Discord together mm -hmm. and you ask the question. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you get immediate feedback because I can't tell you how many times the hardest thing about Blender, which you don't know because you're so far away from this yeah, time, <laughs> but one, one motherfucking gotcha thing that is preventing you from doing the thing you want. And you don't know where it is or how it is. Mm -hmm. It's a button that you didn't click that's all up in the program. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes that button is connected to an entire paradigm that you don't know. <laughs> like if you don't know what UVs are, then not knowing why the texture you put on doesn't look right and having to move it for the first time and going and finding out about a UVs, it's not, you don't just have to learn one thing. You have to learn about a new paradigm yeah. that is called the UVs. Yeah, and so it's, exactly. it's yeah. And in that paradigm, it's a giant field, and you run out in the middle of it, and you grab just one thing from it, like a flower, yeah, exactly. and you run back. And <laughs> yeah. that's, the, and <laughs> that's the annoying thing about 3D, is that there's these universes, yes. like like Elden Ring, and you have to like go all the way into the universe to just pick up one box and run back, and you're not concerned with any other aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And you could spend your entire career just learning like three little things in this whole universe, and you don't even need to know the rest for let's say concept art i know it, it, it's actually been a discovery for myself we uh, at polygon we recently hired a, a head of product who came from 
actually he he came from ea but he was not a 3d artist he's just like pure product he's got a developer engineering background and we were showing him you know polygon this is our product you know you take the texture maps and you you know plug them into the various things and he was sort of looking at it and it was like so wait a minute to make one material for the scene you need five maps and you have to know where they plug in you have to know how to flip <laughs> this channel for this one because it's for this thing and i'm like yeah and he goes why does anybody use 3d <laughs> like he couldn't believe how technical it was and like his joke now is yeah. like anything you think like anything common in other software like 3d software just like buries it in complexity because it just makes it yeah. way too complicated <laughs> Um, well, yeah. looking at those nodes when they get complicated, oh, yeah. especially when you group the nodes and then you make those nodes oh, yeah, and, and you, you double click in them and, and there's hole. more nodes yeah. and nodes. <laughs> and the whole concept of like creativity within that, like how am I going to use a color ramp yeah. to make my displacement bump different? Like mm. you start, you have all these pieces and you know them really well. And then it's all about the creativity of how to combine them and thinking of something new. Mm -hmm. Like you had all the, I remember the first time in Blender where I had all the pieces and I did something that you didn't tell me for the first time. Nice. I just tried something based on the all disparate pieces that I had nice. and it worked and I thought I was a genius. It was a really <laughs> awesome feeling. Yeah, I, I know the feeling. It actually that, that uh, I, I have wanted to do live classes purely so that I can see where everybody else is getting stuck. Because as you said, mm -hmm. it is hot. Like I didn't know that the, the, the windows were that big of a thing. The sub windows trip that many people up, mm -hmm. but yeah anyway that's yeah. a just side thing well most people i got into it because i knew it tripped me up and they uh, had a hard time kind of grasping it but uh normally they would just zoom past it mm. and i always remembered thinking when i was learning blender is that like i i know i only need to know some things but i want to know the framework in which i have to play and how to break it and fix it just in case mm -hmm. especially mm. with windows something goes away and it needs to come back yeah yeah um by the way curious when, when did you because you said all the artists that you're you're working with at one pixel they all use blender <clears throat> when did this shift happen yeah. by the way when did when did concept artists start getting into blender well it happened on last of us 2 okay. uh i think at the beginning of it what happened was we were we were using um a lot of photo bashing mm -hmm. uh as you do yeah and uh as we were and some of the it was looking i mean it was it was awesome it was working really well for us um but throughout the process uh, one person would learn a little bit of 3D because we would do like a quick 3D brace. So it started off where the 3D base was just a gray block mesh. Mm -hmm. And we would manually add all the textures, okay. right? Photo textures uh -huh. and, and, and distort them and add them. Then it became kind of easy to just put a quick texture on there, uh -huh. right? So you could slap a texture on it and then you'd have the texture on there really quick. And this was in Modo. We were still using Modo. Right. Uh, and then... When Blender came out, uh, you know, there's always an intrepid explorer, and then there's always a bunch of followers. Uh, I'm not going to be the first person yeah, uh, yeah. out of the out of the ditch to get shot. You know, <laughs> I'm going to let some other brave, brave souls. And there was some artist like uh, Florent Lebrun, who's one of the best concept artists I think ever, um, and Antoine Boutin and Balash and all these guys and Jad. They would start messing around with uh, and Justin Wentz. Uh, these guys, they would start messing around with 3D, especially Justin. He was like, he was very technically minded. So they would discover on their own all these new tricks and tips. And at the time, we didn't have a Discord. But now we have a Discord where there's constantly information being shared among everybody. But they would discover a new thing. And then they would show someone else how they did it. And then everyone would learn it. And everyone's like, hey, have you tried this new add-on, Scatter? And they're like, no, what's that? It makes grass easy. And everyone's like, Poof. And then everyone's using that. Mm. And then, you know, after some time passes, someone's like, well, actually, scatter's bullshit. It's real heavy on your scene. I, you know, I actually <laughs> think you just take the nodes and you spread them on, on a card. And then you you shrink wrap that card to the geometry, which is what we just, I just found that out like a few months ago at a workshop. Uh, Piotr, one of our art directors, he was like, no, I don't mess with scatter. It's heavy. <laughs> bullshit. And he's all about scene optimization. Nice. It's nice. all about scene optimization. Yeah. So he takes his grass and he puts it on a square. Uh, that he puts a few subdivisions on and then he shrink wraps it to the terrain and then he moves the whole thing, right? And it's shrink wrapped. So the grass, you can do whatever you want. Whereas scatter was a little unwieldy to like yeah. paint and do the, the you know, do the, the paint thing where you want the grass to be and not be. It was fussy. You put a few squares in, you can just move those suckers around real quick. So 
it goes from like this to an add-on to someone thinks of a new thing to a new thing to a new thing. And I would say, I would say every two weeks, there's something new on the Discord on our Discord. Every week, someone's learning a new thing. So, and th this um, Discord is I heard this is just internally at one pixel, bro. It's internal Discord. Yeah, I think it's one of the best. I think it's one of the things that uh, the team likes most. And it wasn't even my idea. Because I was perfectly happy coordinating everything through Airtable, oh, yeah. a project management tool. Uh -huh. And I was like, what do we need to talk for? I don't need to talk. I talk all I want to talk. I tell you what to change. What's the problem? And someone else convinced me. One of the artists said, we need a Discord. And I was like, fine, but I'm not, you know, whatever. You set it up. So he set up the Discord. And it turned out to be this amazing place because all of our artists are remote. So this was an incredible place where everybody mm -hmm. can communicate. And it's gotten a little more organized over the years. Now we talk about jobs on there. And we also have like conversations where we have a channel just for mid journey. We have a channel just for, um, we just made one for mental health because a lot of the guys are stressed out and artists work late and artists, you know, all of us, we don't have good like eating habits or work life balance mm -hmm. and stuff. So we have a channel for that. And now we have a channel for tips and tricks that we pin. So there's constantly people learning new things. And we have our art directors who are incredibly good who uh, are better than me uh, because I was doing this by myself for about 10 years. The past two years, I've been raising and trying to get basically the artists to become art directors to be able to replace me to some degree. Mm. Um, and what's incredible about that is they have their own set of skills. They're way more technical than me. And that's great because I've been out of the game at a professional level. My girlfriend makes fun of me. She says, you're not even a concept artist, you're a hobbyist. Oh. And I'm like, ooh. ooh. How'd you know that one? Ooh, to that's get a you. burn. <laughs> <laughs> it, was pretty, it was a pretty sick burn. Because she's a concept artist oh, as well. Okay. Nice. Uh, but um, I don't have to deal with, uh, I don't have to deal with um, the rigors of trying to do things fast. And so our art directors, uh, what they'll do is sometimes they will be able to help the artist, but they'll be able to go into the blend file and be like, this layer organization first of all is your first problem that's bullshit second of all i just turned on this add-on that tells you how many polys are and everything why the fuck is there that many polys yeah. in the so they can go in and like troubleshoot the actual scene mm -hmm. and you know blender concept art i don't know how it is in when you're a 3d artist but we're trying to create a world so the scene gets heavy fast yeah, yeah. and you can't even you can't even play ball if you don't have a three series nvidia card oh, yeah, like no, yeah. you have a 2080 you can <laughs> You can barely survive. Yeah. Like, uh, you need at least a 3060, 3070, 3080, 3090 to even just start being able to move things around. Mm. And in concept art, it makes an actual, it's the one actual obstacle. Because now you can learn from anyone in the world uh, online super easily. But the one real obstacle, especially if you don't have a ton of money, is that you need a $3,000 computer. Uh, there's just yeah. no way around it. You <laughs> yeah, can't true. do this job. It's true. It's true. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's... My laptop is... It, it, in yeah. a way, it, it's like, it's no different to like, I mean, some artists, they're like, oh, you know, it's not about the hardware, it's not about the kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, but if you're like, a, you know, if you're hired to dig a hole and you're doing it with a spade and a shovel and a pickaxe, you're going to get replaced by somebody who just bought the excavator, you know, <laughs> like, because they're just going to yeah. be able to tear Yeah, the it. speed... <laughs> totally. The speed is one thing, but also... Um, it actually changes your mind. It mm, changes your brain. It so if you were to, to move the light in a scene and move it, mm. and it takes even three seconds to refresh oh, that, you lose your mental momentum to iterate. Yeah. You move it, and it goes gunk, gunk, and then you, you, you look away, and then you might take your phone out. And it, your know. concentration's blown. Your energy is gone. It's just like in Photoshop. If you sometimes back in the day, if you new versions of Photoshop would be worse than the previous version because they'd be slower, and the brush refresh would not be instant. You know, yeah, so you do a brush stroke and it wouldn't refresh instantly. Uh -huh. It would refresh after a split second. Even that was enough to destroy yeah. your drawing. Yeah. You can't you can't get rhythm because you have to go ba 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 ba. You have to do it that mm -hmm. speed. Uh, so yeah, the computer unfortunately matters a lot, and you really do need. I mean, whatever you buy with a three, if you're out there looking, you know, whatever you buy with a three series, maybe a new four series is coming out soon. So, mm -hmm. um, Nvidia card, yeah, is gonna. Is that, gonna that's that's my recommendation to to artists. Like people go like, oh, you know, what what's what 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 are good buys? What are bad buys? It's like bad buys schools generally. Um, <laughs> the amount of money spent on schools yeah. and the quality of them, there's a huge discrepancy. 
And then one one thing that'll buy it that will always be worth its weight is is a, a good graphics card. Just upgrade that. Yeah, I al I almost want to make a video a tutorial that's just for moms explaining what we do so that they don't have to tell uh, their friends that their kids are graphic designers. Oh yeah, and true. to explain. <laughs> Because all moms think their kids are graphic designers. And you're like, okay, I mean, you can learn a new thing, right? I mean, you went to college yourself. <laughs> I, mean, you, you, I can explain to you what I do, and you can't understand it. So I was thinking about making a video for all moms. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, school is the number one thing that's really tough for people because if you're thinking about being a professional concept artist and you're like, my parents want me to go to school, if they're paying for it, fine, let them pay for it. It's their money. Yeah. <laughs> for, if it gives them peace of mind, let them have it. And if you're immature like I was and you need school because you're not really not ready to get all after it, you know, mm -hmm. you're like all pimply and uncomfortable and don't know who you are and you're not about to like be this psycho motivated. Like I met a 15 year old at our workshop, 15, from a village in Slovakia who's better than most concept artists. Mm -hmm. He got it, he started working on it four years ago when he was like 11 and he just knows Blender really well and all he needs is a little bit of compositional help. Mm -hmm. Nice. He's almost nice. there. So if you're not one of those, if you're not one of those savant, like super motivated people, maybe you need college, but just, and you might still want to go just because you want to have a college experience because that's fair mm -hmm. too, but art school is not really a college experience. It's not like you're in a sorority, you know, or fraternity, like, you know, with your shirt off, swinging it around. It's like, it's all a bunch of art indoor kids who aren't fun anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's I'm just true. kidding. They're fine. I, this, I just didn't, I didn't have fun at art school that much. <laughs> I didn't like I didn't like find my peoples, you know. We weren't like, yeah, we're driving our Mustang down the street doing burnouts right. and smoking weed behind the jack in the box. Right. Um, right. But uh, yeah, if you're going to it for the degree because your parents and you think this degree is important because it's something you can fall back on, you can't fall back on it. It's paper. It, it's meaningless mm -hmm. in our profession. And by the way, if you think I'm gonna just, uh, but what if the art thing doesn't work out? Well, why would you think like that? Just make it work. Anyone can do it. You can do it. If you can focus and motivate and learn from people and not be an egotistical sort of incel about your uh, about what you're good at, you know, you can actually learn from people, you will get there. Mm -hmm. Unless you have some, some handicap or reason you can't. You have a brain. You absolutely will get there. That idea that, like, uh, I have my one life and I'm going to die soon, like in 50 years, and I'm going to, like, Make a, I'm going to make a decision to maybe do this thing, but I, but I love that tons and tons, hundreds of thousands of people do. It's not like it's pro basketball. It's not like up to other people. Mm -hmm. It's not like acting or pro basketball or something where there's gatekeepers. Yeah, it's true. There are no it's gatekeepers. True. That's very true. It's just your ability. Yeah. You, could, you could be living in a village in Sri Lanka, and you could send me a portfolio that was good, and tomorrow you would be working. Yeah. And you would be making baller-ass America money, not Sri Lanka money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yep. That's so true. It, it, it can so, also be depressing uh, this is when, such when a democratic it's, like, it, it's all on you as well. You know, <laughs> when it's like, shit, yeah. the reason I'm not hired is I'm just not good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you're competing with, like, the best in the world, yes. too, because the playing field, it's like, it's like playing Halo online back in the day, uh -huh. which is the last time I played an <laughs> online game, just to date myself. It's, uh, it's like playing Halo online. Like, yeah, you're, you're competing with the best in the world. So, you know, if you're not coming, if you're not bringing it, you can't even really, you know, you have to be bringing it pretty yeah, hard. Yeah, I, I'm curious because we, we, we spoke about this before hitting record. Uh, storytelling and composition. And why is it important? Yes. The, composition is something that I have a love-hate relationship in terms of like talking about it. Because if you look up composition online, it's all rules that seem bogus. Huh. You know, <laughs> like tangents and this line has to line up with this line. It almost becomes like conspiracy, like drawing triangles on things. They're working backwards from an image that works. And I find it difficult to explain to artists how to create an appealing composition um, that isn't just a bunch of rules that are all BS. I don't know. What are your thoughts on it? Yes, I have a lot of things to say about this. Let me pull up my screen. <laughs> all right. Got it. I can okay. see the screen. Okay, awesome. cool. So I, 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 I did this at a workshop and I just wanted to, I think this image is a good way to explain what, uh, what composition is. Because for composition, uh, it's not just in a vacuum. Because, you know, t in the old days, they would just say, okay, make a nice composition where you can see the things, right? So there's the character here and there's the mountain and there's like the castle they're going to in the distance. 
right? And the castle is maybe mm-hmm. silhouetted against the, the light background and it's dark and the person is silhouetted too. Um, but composition is a lot of times about like uh, telling a story and, and we say that a lot about like, oh, telling a story, what does that mean? But it's just, it's just a way to say someone is doing something. That's it. Someone is doing something and that's something they're doing, you can read it, meaning you can see it in the composition. You don't need it explained to you. So someone thinking about what job they want next is not visual. You can't see it. So it doesn't, it's not a thing. Uh, but like a guy walking through an environment with a gun and the gun is held down and he's walking slowly, you can see that and you can know I'm investigating the space. So I did this little scribble over thing uh, just to use a photo. So this is just a straight Ooh. photo, okay? And okay. this pa- yes, this, yeah. this paint over here on top of it, you can see there was just a bunch of choices made about, and this is just to show you the kind of thinking that I would have about composition. And I'll turn these on and off slowly so you can see the differences. I used, you know, it's not a finished concept, of course, it's just a scribble, but I did a lot of things that look like they're uh, not on purpose, but they all had extreme intent. They were all designed around telling a story. And, And the thing is, you know, in concept art, people are like tasked with doing an environment of a mountain scene. They aren't tasked with telling a story. But the difference about One Pixel Brush is we're always going to add a story no matter what because it's fun and it's cool and it makes the image fun. You know, it makes the image fun to look at. But on top of that, it gives you a reason to do things. So right here, like we have like these pools of light, right? And we have this mountain up here. Um, And we have this just, you know, it's just a nice vista. But as soon as you say, okay, I'm going to have this writer in this scene, right? And he's going to be racing to get to some barn in the background. And that's not a complicated story. It's a guy going somewhere. It's a horse rider, and he's obviously heading to this location. Well, then, as soon as I decide that, I can start making decisions that are going to really dramatically affect the composition. Like, okay, this pool of light's going to be here. Why is it here? It's here so he can, so that the top of his head can be silhouetted. Why? So he can be a first read. Why? Because he's the main character. So... Then once I have that, it's actually not that complicated storytelling. It's basically, most people can't do it that well because they're not dumb enough. You have to be really dumb. You have to just be dumb in your head. Like the guy's head, it's dark and it's on light. It's not that complicated. And then visually there's a dumbness (laughs) to, okay, this log used to be just a stump, right? It used to be a stump. And now it's not, now it's a log. But the reason it's a log is compositional reasons, storytelling reasons. Okay, this is a guy going to this, but this log is heading the same direction as he is. And there's another little broken piece right here. It even has this little notch in it, which kind of breaks it up a little bit nicely, adds a little bit of interest, but doesn't stop the momentum of this log, which also keeps your eye in the picture. You know, keeps your eye going where we want it to go. His goal is the is the is the farmhouse here. Well, if the goal is the farmhouse here, I'm using the pieces that I have. Like here are the pieces that are on the board. I got light and I got trees and I got stuff. So okay, if I can have uh, light, then I'm gonna light this side of the barn so that it has a nice little contrasty read because the guy is going this way towards it, and I want that to read. And it's it's kind of light against these trees that are dark. So when you zoom out, you kind of see this guy really clearly, kind of going from here to here. And then these trees, well, they're on purpose. The cool thing about trees is they can be anywhere and they can be any shape. So trees, clouds, grass, organics are really good for building a composition because you can put them anywhere believably. Because you see, you can only do it with pieces that make sense. You can't make this a giant robot that helps the composition. You can only use the pieces you have on the board. And so with trees, you know, it's all about keeping your eye in the composition. And then, not all it can't be too regimented too right you can't have a tree that's like this tree and this tree and then the cloud is here it can't be too even there has to be a randomness Mm -hmm. to it so that you're leading them into the composition without being too obvious so that was why the break you know i wanted to make an arrow Mm -hmm. but i wanted to not let the audience know that i'm making an arrow um these trees just felt Mm -hmm. like that these trees couldn't be here by themselves so just like bob ross they need a little friend right here and and they couldn't be the same distance You know, they couldn't be the same distance. 
And I'm, I'm explaining things that are really uh, innate, right? I'm, these are things that just kind of, I was doing them and I'm trying to reverse engineer them because when you're making it, you're just, especially when you're doing it fast, you just put things where they need to go. And you don't think about it too much. You just know, like you put this here and in a split second you erased it and maybe you put it here and in a split second you erased it and put it here because you, because you subconsciously knew that this needed to be close because they couldn't be even. Uh, and then a big old tree here. Nobody wants to go over here. Uh, this is like no man's land. This is like don't go here. Keep going this way. Move along. Move along, buddy. And then there's also this water. You can see that wasn't in there. But it, it's cued off the water yeah. that was there, so it feels believable. But it's more water. So in case you do get sidetracked and your eye goes over here and adds a little interest, you'd be like, nope, get back on the train. We're not going here. We're going over here. We're going to the story. And if your eye got tempted to go out of the picture because there's some cool stuff happening up here, we're like, nope, nope, you're not allowed. Stop. Turn around. <laughs> Turn around. Head back this way, eye. Right. Head back this way. So uh, good compositions. Yeah. There's just there's a shitload going on that is, like, really subtle. But the, pro the tricky part is if you are starting to make a concept and you don't know where the dude or girl is going and what they're doing – then you don't have a reason to make all these decisions. Therefore, you won't. Therefore, it just won't look like a composition that's anything because you don't know why you're doing it. So the reason we always add a story is not just because it's fun to see a character in the shot or a stick salesman standing there looking off in the distance. It's because telling a story <laughs> gives the, the picture meaning. And it doesn't matter if you're only hired. The job they asked you to do is just to paint a mountain landscape adding that one little bit no one in 10 years has ever said we asked for a mountain landscape not a dude going to a barn no human can look at something with another <laughs> human story and say i hate that you know so mm -hmm. i wanted to show just a little bit about how we think about that process so um we wrote a quick we wrote a quick script and, and just to clarify this is a no client this is purely just for fun for your own internal studio. exactly well it's for fun but it's also because we've been doing we do a lot of things for a lot of different clients and i wanted to coalesce it into what we are moving into next which is okay. um which actually i can talk about because i think it's actually the future of concept art since we were talking about concept art is dead last time i think it would be before i chat about this let me talk about what i think is going to happen in concept art sure. in the next whatever uh, years and I'm going to draw it out here because I think it's easier if I draw it. Okay. So, you know, like we, we had a time when it was just like drawing, right? The Ralph McQuarrie days. And I don't know if you saw the new uh, Lucasfilm. Uh, it's on Disney Plus, but it's the history of Lucasfilm. It's like the coolest thing I've oh, ever really? seen. It's so I interesting. That. Okay. Yeah, it's unbelievable. It's how they did Star Wars. We're talking like, you know, they're taking model kits and putting them together and the stress of it and, and these badasses in engineering technology. It was amazing. Oh, wow. So, you know, we started off like drawing and painting, right? And then the next phase of that was that we started using Photoshop, okay? And the Photoshop was still drawing and painting, but it kind of, you know, it, it was done digitally. Then uh, it started using 3D, which is the era that, you know, you helped usher in, and we started using 3D. So now our concepts are 3D. Well, the final thing, like, okay, right here, this mm -hmm. is this is Avengers, okay? Let's say this is Avengers, the final VFX shot. Mm -hmm. Now, what's what's the reason that our 3D is not ready for final VFX? Well, some of it is skill and talent and ability and time, but a lot of it is technology. A lot of yeah. it is like, well, we can't push a billion polys a second. Like this, you know, we can't, we don't have a way to like rig uh, Hulk with all the muscles and stuff. There's a lot we can't do, but what started happening here is on like shows like The Mandalorian and all those other shows, they started using those LED volumes. Have you seen those before oh, yes. or heard of those? Yes, yes. Okay, it, so the that LED the volume. Okay, let's see. I actually have a great... This was uh, on set. I was with a production designer that we work with named Francois who did uh, Ford Ferrari and a bunch of other um, awesome films. and. Uh, Unreal invited us, uh, or Epic invited us to this stage. Now you can see there's a camera here, right? And then there's this uh, Old West scene. Now this Old West scene is built entirely in Unreal, okay? And that's Francois, mm -hmm. and uh, and they're walking right here. And you can see them. Now it looks pretty 
janky here, right? Like, it, you know, you can see the 3D, but you know, I'm not filming it very well. It looks okay. But now, this is the monitor here on the right. Like, watch when I turn my camera towards the monitor and they walk through it. They're like perfectly and entirely lit exactly like the scene because what's happening is this isn't just um this isn't just a digital image on the wall it's actually projecting light so all the light from that digital the unreal scene is being projected into the space so anything you put in that space is lit perfectly and exactly how it should be and you can put unreal characters back there and um, as that technology gets more advanced you can see the roof up there it's not like perfect you can see these are trackers right here that track everything. Um, the one thing you can't see is when the camera moves, whatever the camera's looking at, that entire part of the screen moves in 3D. So that's the misleading thing. Unless you're on the stage, you don't see that part. But when that camera, that the virtual camera, the, the real life camera that's sitting there has trackers on it, when that thing moves, the entire, the entire 3D scene moves in parallax to adjust to the camera the camera's looking at. Mm -hmm. So if it moves fast, mm -hmm. things move faster. It's not just like a static image because that, that they would have thought of a long time ago. But you can see there's projecting light coming from the top as well. And that's it. It's just a little stage. And that's the camera. You can see it's got three little trackers on there. Okay. Mm. So we were working with James Chinland, uh, another production designer who did the new Batman movie. And he was telling us that like on this other project, but he was telling us on Batman, they did a huge amount of that. Um, where they basically... With LED volumes. With LED volumes, but, I mean, gigantic ones. And I'll show you another bigger one here. This was another soundstage we went to. So this is a giant one with a car driving through an environment. And you can mm. see the wall of LED volumes right here, or LED, like, panels, mm. one after the other. And, you know, the Unreal looks okay, but the way it works is they don't necessarily, like, they shoot it, okay, and then they have that 3D that's in the background. But they can easily just replace the 3D later with better 3D. What they get out of the 3D is really good lighting on the scene and the actors feeling like they're in the space. And if it's like a yeah. shot where it's kind of out of focus and let's say you can see the actor, but the background is out of focus, then you could just use it outright. Like then you could just sometimes mm -hmm. you could just film it and it'll just be done and you don't have to like uh, replace the 3D in post. But just to show you some of the things, pull up this guy here. So, you know, this guy's real life and this background is fake behind him. Mm. They, did, they did it in Mandalorian here. They drew it out so you could see the difference. Here's an amazing thing that they showed us on the set that was like a lot of oohs and ahs. Oh, by the way, you can see the camera now is pointing at him and you can see the square that it's making on the LED volume because it only shows what it shows and that part moves separately. So as the camera moves, only what's in the camera's frame kind of appears. And this is a crazy thing you can do. You can have someone in Unreal sitting right behind you and they just make this sphere of light on the LED volume and now there's a light cast on the guy because the whole thing's emitting light. Mm. So you can move circles of white or any color you want all around the LED volume and then you can light the people that are in the scene. Right. Instead of needing grips and everyone to manually move things, it's just like, eh, with a mouse. Yep. You just move <laughs> it and you, you click it up a few steps. So this is the scene from the beginning of Mandalorian. You can see, like, mm -hmm. this one is, even though the roof is a little bit janky, it, it does the job of looking like he's in ambient light, you know, and that's what you need. Yeah. yeah this is exactly. hilarious because the set only goes to here and then it extends digitally. This too. Oh, true. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Yeah, they built it to here. The LED volume starts right there, and then the rest of the volume is just the ship, right? Wow. Impressive. So the cool thing about that, so let me pull up my, my scene here. Um, this is Blender, Andrew. Um, if you need any tips or any help on how to use it, you know who to call. <laughs> yeah, please. <laughs> okay, so, yeah, all tidbits and feedback I can help you with. So... This is the guy here, and I just kind of made a recreation of the scene so you could see. Now, I turned off the what I had in there. All I have is this white light. So, like, obviously, if I make it red, everything's red. And I'm going to click on the camera. So my camera is exactly where the camera is, right? But uh, And by the way, this is how you connect uh, nodes, just in case you needed to know, just like this. It's very <laughs> <Yeah>. easy. <laughs> String of um, 
So, um, okay, I put this like simple environment here. Just this like, you know, I just grabbed a photo and I stretched it shittily. Now, if I go back to the camera, you can see this guy here. And uh, I just kind of recreated what it would be, which is like, okay, I rotate that scene and you can see the light on him is rotating. And it's gonna be exactly accurate to what the environment is. So that's essentially what they're doing in a film. I'm just making it here like virtually. Now, the crazy thing about this is you don't have to be some kind of genius to kind of imagine that, okay, if the concept artist is building it in 3D and the final VFX are in 3D and the LED volume is in 3D, well, I mean, how long is it before these three things can just be merged? Like, I mean, is it that long? I don't think so. And I think as soon as these things connect where, hey, listen, there's a there's an RTX, you know, 7550 that's just blazing beyond belief. Um, you have AI that could possibly help you create environments too. Um, you could build an incredibly quick 3D scene with unlimited ability. It can go directly because finally Unreal makes a, you know, connector to Blender or finally all these pipelines get sorted out because now it's a fucking mess. But as soon as these pipelines mm-hmm. get sorted out, it, it's not impossible to imagine a world where there's going to be one person here who comes up comes up with the environment, comes up with the concept, is modeling it, is lighting it, is doing the cinematography, is putting it in the volume, and it's final VFX. Now, yeah. I know it's ridiculous to say that now because this is like across like hundreds of people in many professions, but like... All you have to do is just imagine a little that a few things get more advanced and then that's where we are. Um, And so this one person essentially becomes like an art god person. I mean, they're going to be deciding everything. They're going to be at least having the first pass at almost everything. And that's really exciting for concept artists. Now, it doesn't have to be a concept artist. It could be a production designer who learns 3D. It could be a 3D artist who learns a little bit about composition and cinematography. It could go a lot of ways, but I, I don't see it going for very long before this all becomes a reality. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It's basically what, going back to your question of why are we not from the 3D on the left to the 3D on the right, what's stopping it? It's cost, really, you know, to create Avengers. It's, you got to have a team of artists to do like one little asset here. If there's AI, which... I mean, this would have been a stretch to say a year ago, but now it seems like inevitable. Um, if you can just type out a prompt, you know, New York City, but set in such and such, sunlit from the West, uh, rainy. I imagine that the 3D software could build that eventually. Um, yeah. With just I mean, how, fo- how far is that? It'll fix a few things, but yeah, not that far. So, so should, I, we I talk mean, a- I- should we do the AI portion <laughs> of this? <laughs> Let's let's do the AI discussion. Um, okay, my let's my do the... predictions are, are are like shorter than everyone else's. My, mine is okay. like two to five. <laughs> two to five. But maybe not for that for that elaborate New York scene building, but until the point where you can type in a prompt and have a pretty good model created for you in three D. So, okay, what do you think? So, what do you see as happening? Because there's like, okay, so I made this the other day, right? And this looks good to me. And this is better mm. than most artists. Like this is cool, it's interesting. The shapes are kind of good. The shape thing is that I thought was like only humans could do it. Let me see if I can find another one. Oh, by the way, I want to invent a new thing called just type your name in and see what happens. This is what I got. <laughs> yeah. It's fun. Actually, yeah. you, you'd have to be, I mean, you'd probably come up because you have to be someone of some note for it to know. Uh-huh. But like, for example, I was doing I was doing this. It's really hard to stomach, but okay, let's say this. Okay, these alien tree designs. They, I wasn't even intending to do alien tree designs. But this painting with all the subtleties of colors that are changing in here and this beautiful, beautiful cream that goes into this beautiful teal with this nice gradient and then this bizarre really cool tree that I've never seen before that I've never imagined I've never seen an artist do this isn't better than uh, some artists this is better than most for one second of work so I just don't see how this is not going to be the end of everything like I, I just I don't see how because if 
if this came in one second, I mean, I did a, I did a little bit of work, but it's better than most artists, including me. Um, I can try my best. And so what I'm trying to do right now with, with AI is I'm trying to beat myself or beat, like get a brief from a client and try to do it. Like not just dicking around, like actually try to do it. So this was this image. This is kind of the best I could do. And I only messed around with it for an hour or so. Uh, my buddy Aton, he messed around with it for eight hours. The designs he has are incredible. Like they're really good. But mm -hmm. so, okay, I did, that was that. Now, my version, okay, so I was, I wanted some Sky Island type thing, okay? So this was my version. There's a concept I did, all right? And I was trying my best to make a cool composition, to make interesting shapes. Uh, you know, it took me like three or four days to put a cool castle at the end of it, to have some depth. Mm -hmm. I was using Blender. You know, I was doing, you know, my best. And I'm not saying that this is, you know, one could argue that this is slightly cooler. The castle's more interesting. The There's a lot of more interesting th shapes and things going on. And that only took one second. So, like, I, yeah. I just, I don't see how it's not game over. Like, uh, you know, the cool thing, though, is humans, we are really hesitant to replace ourselves. And it actually poses for me, like, a lot of bigger questions. Like, the reason this is so scary, because it's an existential problem. If we love art, right, and we did it for our whole lives, and suddenly there's a technology that makes what we've done our whole lives uh, pointless, meaning we it could be done in one second. Then we're stuck with the hor horrific burden of wondering, well, then what was the point of our whole lives? Or bigger, what is the point of anything, right? So for humans, looking at this, it's very scary for humans because, you know, except for some people who have really strong faith, or maybe a lot of people do, we kind of don't know what the point of anything is. And so we make do with living our lives and doing things we enjoy and that we love. And if you find out that a robot just decimated you forever uh, in the thing that you love most and a robot does it better than you, it's like, it's very tough to stomach. I totally agree. And I, I think I have slowly been accepting that, that sort of realization myself a little bit, that it is, that that's why it's so uncomfortable is that we, we've really spent the last 10 years learning technical skills um things that basically just take a take a long time and learning all the little settings and you know what the difference between multiply and subtract is and all the technical things like that to get the software to do exactly what we want and that has become a filter for anyone else who wants to create it because they have to learn all those little in all those little things themselves and Essentially, AI will make it to the point that they, everybody else now gets a shortcut. They get to skip the last 10 years of your life. Yeah. And where does that leave you? Now you have to rely on a completely different skill set of creativity, of aesthetics. And those have been, especially in 3D, the most neglected skills. Um, mm. because 3d is so technical most 3d artists are just very 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 good at the technical skills that we're not prepared to create aesthetically good things i actually think concept artists like yourself have a bigger advantage because someone like my sister or my mom like they they might be able to type in prompts but they're not going to be able to get this result because for one a lot of it is you probably went through a number of prompts you went through a number of variants and you were able to pick and guide it to what you knew yeah. actually looks pleasing. Whereas somebody else yeah. would have stopped at the start where they just had like an island and gone, oh, it looks amazing, you know? And they wouldn't know how to actually create something aesthetically that gets there because they don't know how to refine it or like where to stop basically or, or how to change it. It's true that maybe I have that little advantage, but what do you think is, what do you think is the, the, the worst case scenario for humans end game. Like, uh, okay, like let's say it can replace the technical, but let's just hypothetically say, because we don't have to say that for sure AI is better or worse right now. I think it's 
shockingly good. Some other people do. Some other people are closing their eyes and being like, la, la, la. Some people, in order to find out how good it is, have to spend some time with it and they hate it, so they're not going to. But imagine this world. Cause I, I listened to, you know, I, I listened to an interview with the guy who founded it. Uh, there was an interview on The Verge, uh, and he Sam was being Altman. interviewed. Yes, I think. Who was the Mid Journey? The Mid Journey, David. Oh, I don't know something. the Mid Journey. That was the Dolly guy. Uh, but anyway. Yeah, David. So um, he was saying, which I fully expected, he said, uh, you know, I don't see this replacing artists. I see this as a tool. But, uh, and, and it tends to be, you know, things like that have more gravity when they're coming from the person who invented it. Because we are humans and we trust the human, right? It's the human. The human knows. The humans don't know shit. Nobody knows that Facebook could be a tool to decimate democracy in the world. Nobody knew that. Mark Zuckerberg didn't set out to be like, I'm going to cause murders and potentially incredible connection, but also there's going to be this side effect where dictators can control their entire population through misinformation. Like, there's no way that could have been foreseen. And humans don't care. Like, they say they care, but we all want to do our thing more. The guy invented this awesome thing. He wants it to be a cool thing. He's excited about it. It's new technology. No human ever since the beginning of man has ever seen a new technology and been like, Yes, but what are the consequences? I know it's going to make a lot of things easier and a lot of things better for a lot of people, but what's the trade-off? Nobody ever does that. We only move forward. And so it's not hard to imagine a world, for me, where you have an implant in your brain. You just – it knows what you like because it has mapped all of your memories that you've ever had. And it creates on the fly entertainment that's perfectly suited to what your emotional needs are. I mean, I don't mean yep. just like AI. I mean like the whole film. Like the Shosh I want Shawshank Redemption, but I want it like in space. And they're like, "Yes, I know you said that, but we know your we know your history with your father. So we're gonna add a little bit of twist to something that we know is gonna cater to you because we have access to the database of every fucking memory you've ever had." And then, okay, so let's just hypothetically say that happens. Like the AI is creating entertainment perfectly suited in every way that's catered to the individual and connected to other people if you want. Then what? Then what do we do? And oh, by the way, everything's paid for. The state takes care of you. You can eat, drink. Uh, like no, there's no poverty. It's like a utopia of entertainment. Then what? We 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 would still be struggling with that same thing of like we don't know why we're here. We don't know why anything. So AI, why when something like AI yeah. expl explodes in our face, it just to me it just reminds us. Of all of the of all of the unknowns about why about our own existence. Mm. No, yeah, you're not wrong. Um, and to to even further make it bizarre, you, you mentioned Shawshank Redemption, but in space as a movie. Why does the movie need to end? You know, it could be a perpetual <laughs> yeah. world just generated for you. In which case, everyone's got their own little virtual matrix that they jump into. Yeah, you know. It's just yeah, it, what it's we... just a world. It's got lives. It's got complexities. It's got. It's just the world that you want it to be, with just enough challenge and just enough opportunity and fun. And that's that's the whole uh, the whole metaverse concept. Quick pause to talk about you as a three D artist. You want to be able to create good images. We all do. And that means you have to use your time wisely. And using your time wisely is not spent dealing with assets that you find randomly online user generated content is great when it works and is bad really bad when it fails that means if you buy a model or you buy a texture or material it should just work and that is the problem that we are trying to solve at polygon we are a team of artists who are vetting the content that we create to create high quality textures and models and hdrs that just work We've got very experienced artists that work in the industry. We know what goes into a good quality asset, and that is what we strive to create. So we have artists around the world that are going out capturing rare types of materials, generating models, and that is all at Polygon, of course, my company, P-O-L-I-I-G-O-N.com, where you can find all sorts of assets for your next project. The link is in the show notes uh, description, wherever it is, or Polygon, P-O-L-I-I-G-O-N.com for all of your asset needs. Now, back to the interview. 
Um, so we are inherently special, uh, and we we think that. And there's a lot of you know world world religions that have kind of taught us that because we really want to be. But it's actually like I'm I'm kind of unsure if um, I think the point of our existence is just to function and be happy doing the thing that we love. But trying to make a greater meaning out of it is hard, especially considering the context of the human species and how all these things just came along at different times and were kind of a product of circumstance. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited about um, AI and the advancement of people, but I just don't have, I'm not as much of a humanist as I used to, you know? Like there used to be, I'm not saying I'm Thanos, but I'm just saying I'm not necessarily um, always believing that like, Yes, human beings are here and we might be gone. Maybe we'll kill all ourselves. Maybe, the, I mean, I still want us to, to do good, but uh, we may not. Uh, we may oust ourselves because of AI robots that destroy us. We may destroy the planet and it might recover. But the singular special magicalness of humans from that book gave me context to see like, we're just another species that lived here and we may not be forever. So for me, that's that's uplifting. For me, that's not depressing. It's just like, enjoy the presence that you have enjoy the moments with the people you love that you have enjoy it like your dog would enjoy it like dogs are happy all the time they're not tripping about stuff mm -hmm. uh, and i think that's just a perfectly fine way to live without uh, the constructs of why and how and what the bigger uh, reasons for it all because i think it's unknowable it definitely is it definitely is um and it it, it definitely you can see it a lot when people are discussing AI. I'm sure you've seen it on like Facebook and discords, people that are very angry about it. Um, and, and I, in a way I, I, I've had moments where I feel the same, but it, it's, it's really, it's because it's become our identity, you know? And we, we feel yeah. like this has just arrived and it's doing work that used to take an artist a day in a couple of seconds. And that's not fair. Yeah. You know? But why? Why it's is it not fair? fair? You know, like, yeah. Why? And it's well, it's because yeah. I, I, I feel like I was, I am owed the rewards for the effort that I put in. You know, <laughs> you know, yeah. and yeah. that's yeah. unfortunately it it's, it's, it it's, sucks. It's just not the way the world works. You know, that there was a guy who, who used the... to, you know, uh, vets the build barns for horses, like so much stuff that was yeah. around that, and then it was just. Whoosh, just changed and we all just yeah. adapt to that yeah we all it sucks, that's and that's it's, it's it, it may suck but but all change all human change is completely inevitable so and I, we've all seen it so much in our lifetime i mean i was yeah. born in 1979 so like everyone who's been around or even knows about the last hundred years the the change and the rate of change just from like drawing to photoshop to 3d to like just in one profession so yeah yeah i think yeah. it's futile resistance is futile yes you just have to <laughs> grab it wait till wait till it gets as as good as you and as soon as it does utilize it and then and then find something else that's tangential to mm -hmm. do exactly. it can't tell stories yet so maybe you segue into that once it can then get into picking the right stories and then once it gets good at that, then then yeah, maybe we'll all be really screwed. I have some money saved up, so uh, <laughs> yeah, um, that's right. Yeah, the stock market that's is okay. Right. Bitcoin went down quite a bit. Uh, save your money and uh, move somewhere maybe where they, there's a lot of state uh, support for things like Norway. You know. Yeah. <laughs> I, I by the way, I would also say by the way, just as someone who's like feeling like, oh, you know, are, are the studios just going to be laying off artists? Uh, I, I think that yes, some jobs will disappear, but I don't think that the, the the cost will change. I think they'll be hiring more artists in different roles in much the same way that like, you know, you used to have a lot more money spent on Retopo or um, a, a lot of things that are now just sort of automated uh, positions. Um, they, they, it just, it's a constantly moving game. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just like that thing I was I was saying with because uh, it's happening a lot in concept art, that thing I was saying where it goes from like it used to be drawing and then it's 3D and then it's LED volume and then it's final VFX. The same thing happened to music. I was at GDC this last year and I was talking to someone who composes music and he was saying, yeah, we used to like have to like get all the samples and sound effects and then we had these mixing boards and then we could compile. We could basically use a keyboard to make any sound we can think of. And I watched this, he told me that, and I had just finished watching a masterclass with Hans Zimmer, which if you guys don't know about masterclass, it's the most unbelievable website 
because it has people from the top in their field from all over the world. Now, granted, they're not in depth, not at all. Yes. But the Hans Zimmer one kind of was a bit in depth. Like okay. he got That's into right. it quite a bit into his thinking. And I don't, I'm not a musician, but because of the parallels to art and because it was similar to art, but a completely different field, it was so endlessly fascinating to right. me. Right. Wow. But it would just be, but Hans Zimmer has the ability to basically make any, he composes completely on the keyboard. He records his own samples because he's cool like that. And then when he's done, he gets a real live orchestra with specific musicians that he handpicks because he likes the way they play the violin. Mm. That one person. And uh, it was super interesting, but you could easily imagine an AI violin player that has the exact, even better, with the yes. right amount of like magic, where that violin player, the, the last piece of the puzzle that isn't digital, could be removed. Yes. And that would suck. To be a because violinist. what a yes, shame. That's right. Because they spent their whole life, and it's an amazingly difficult skill, especially that skill. But that could happen. But for us, the audience, we'd be watching the movie, and we wouldn't be like, wait a second, is that an AI violin? No, we would just be like, this is Hans Zimmer. He's composing awesome music. That's great. Um, I wanted to talk about some art stuff, uh, a couple more art things. I don't know how much time we have. No, of have course. About? No, go, go ahead, man. As, as much time as you want. Yeah. Um. Something that we noticed, like, I think as we were working on a lot of jobs is that the the difference between, like, concept art and, like, movies is that movies are a lot more subtle. And there's some true things that we see all the time in, um, in concept art that are not necessarily happening in shots from films. And if you watch enough, if you look at enough frames, this site is called Shot Deck and it's amazing. But, uh, for example, this composition right here. Like, if you squint at it, right, in art school, they would traditionally tell you that uh, what you want to do is you want to put the character, like I was showing you in that previous example, you want to put the character in a way where they're going to be silhouetted, right, where you're going to see them, where they're going to be backlit or visible. Now, if you were to squint at this picture, let me see if I can make it smaller. Uh, you can't really, see, the main focal point is the window, right? It's like this bright mm. light window. Mm. And... But if you look at it in full size, because we're humans, our human eye always gravitates towards wherever the human figure is. And so there was something about, after looking at a ton of film stills that I realized is that we're not stuck always very obviously lighting and, and adding contrast at the focal point where you want to look. Because if you look at this picture at full size, your eye immediately goes to the human. Mm. It never looks at the window. It doesn't look at the top of the bed that's being backlit viciously by that light. I mean, the contrast and the shape contrast and the value contrast is maximum. Mm. Yet, it's not where your eye looks first because what we never account for when we're looking at compositions is that humans are looking at it. And humans are drawn to what they find interesting and humans are always looking for the human mm -hmm. or the danger. Mm -hmm. Something that the human eye wants to see. And if you look at a lot of film stills, you'll notice that happens quite a bit. And so when I noticed that, it started kind of a little bit changing the way we work. Like you see this from far away, mm. the character is not even visible. Yeah. But if you look at it full screen, you immediately look at the guy. You don't look at this light and it's super high contrast. Mm. Why is that? That's like against, that's against what we know. Mm. Same with this. This fan is like the focal point. But if you look at it at full res, it's not far away. The fan is the focal point at full res. You immediately look at the human. Mm, yeah. Um, so after looking at a ton of still, same with this, the lamp is like a very bright focal point thing. And it was from, you know, when I was watching Game of Thrones, I noticed this. They had all these like torches in the background. So once we noticed that, I think it freed us up a little bit to, um, to kind of think a different way about how we light and compose images. So we had this idea for this devil monster, right? For this, for this little project, little project we're working on. And I had done these like quick sketches to kind of explain what the process, you know, what the images that were gonna be the most interesting or the most cool should be. Um, and the one of them was that there was this, uh, that the devil was this gigantic, gigantic creature and it just had legs and you never maybe even see it, but it has these disgusting long legs that go into the ground. And if you look at it, you just died. Like, okay. just gazed on it, you immediately died. Like, your eyes melted out of your head. So, there was this idea for a shot that was, like, going to be all these people dead, right, in this scene. And with this giant sort of 
creature walking through. And then also because it's the devil and it came out of a volcano, there's some lava sort of coming with it, mm. right? Wherever it goes, like heat and lava and stuff kind of comes out of the ground. Okay. Now there's a lot of crazy, fun, over the top, sort of cartoony things you could do with it. But, uh, and we were working with one of this, one, done by one of our artists, Kevin, who's amazing. So this was our first, our first pass, mm. you know, mm-hmm. uh, done in 3D, done in Blender. It's got all the legs. Um, it's got the bodies. And now, you know their bodies there because I told you. But, like, when you first glance at this, it's not really clear that there's bodies. Oh, that, like those are really bodies. Tell. Okay, okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So, this is a really f- interesting... I mean, this is the difference between concept art, let's, let's say, and just building stuff in 3D. The, the bodies are there, but you didn't see them. Mm. And you did not see them because they're not visible. They are visible, but you didn't see them. Mm. So, there's a problem, you know? So then we adjusted and we made another composition where the goal was, again, to make it less everything. And that's what's so hard about making something cinematic. And that's why it's so hard for so many artists is because this guy has this cool light on him, right? Beautiful, like light that's casting speck on his arm, but there's no light. Light's gone. Because what we're doing is we're telling a story. And the story here is about the devil. And the devil is coming to kill people with this wall of lava and there's all these dead soldiers now still in this one i kind of can't see the soldiers and i kind of can't tell about the lava Mm. and all those things are there they're all there but you can't feel them you can't sense them or see them yet Mm. so it's kind of an AD job, and the, the point of this is to just, you know, because if we're doing some AI stuff and and we're, we have, every artist has more power, they're all going to start becoming more storytelling based. And so this eye is what you're going to have to tune more and more. We did another version. This one is getting a little better. Um, we're starting to see that there's lava on the ground, um, that maybe the lava is coming with it, but the bodies. You can kind of tell, but they're still really quick. And then there's these other pieces of grass and other taller pieces of grass that are distracting. They're not really nece- maybe that necessary. Mm. Then another version, getting stronger now. But if there's not that much difference. But just the fact that there's one screaming dude right here and then another screaming dude here, it's enough for the eye to be like, okay, there's dead bodies. Mm. Um and then the, the front line of the lava is getting a little more separated and clear. And the light is a little... This smoke in the background is making this kind of monster thing more clear. We still want it to be ambiguous. Um, but then the ground is kind of like... It's really not fitting the tone because it's too contrasty. This is a classic thing that happens in video games. There's just a lot going on in the ground. Mm-hmm. So then, an, let's see. Another version where I, where I asked them to add like some light to give it some pop, but I didn't. I think that was a bad decision on my part. It doesn't. I don't think look better. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we got to this one. Part of it was not making it sixteen by nine anymore, which I think helps because when it's not sixteen by nine, it fills up the damn screen. And everybody loves Letterbox, and Letterbox is cool. But like, yeah. it's also nice when like the image, the image actually fills the screen because nobody's screen is sixteen by nine. So. When you look at this, it just has less impact because you're slightly far away. So whenever you're looking at a 16 by 9 image on your computer, you zoom in one notch so you can see it. Uh-huh. But if it's already zoomed in, you don't. Right. right. And Wait, so, so, so what it, what's the I, aspect I, of this one then? Oh, actually, this is 16 by 9. I misspoke. This is the other one. The, oh, okay, the two, okay. Three, one. okay. Okay, okay. Got it, got it. Yeah. So, yeah. So the, the really, the ultra wide screen always makes the image smaller. So, uh-huh. Yeah, But this one finally came, and this one now, it's like crystal, crystal clear that there's dead people. Yes. It's it's a lot more clear that there's, like, legs and this monstrous thing, and that there's lava emanating from it, and then there's some, like, lava here in the background. And we talked about, like, maybe adding some birds for scale. And then we did another version that's widescreen and added birds, but then we felt like, well, the bird's job was only to tell the scale, not to do any more than that. So they're actually messing up the image a little bit. Mm-hmm. And the middle got a little bit fussier. So there's there's also an element of that in ADing stuff is that like we went this far and we went a little step, which was actually a tiny step backwards because the middle area doesn't quite look as, as clean or as crisp and the lo- the fire is a little bit overdone here in the bottom. And then the birds aren't adding anything. They're just making it more confusing. So 
my point is there's so many art directing yeah art directing yeah yeah Yeah, that's slang for that if i could ask as well (laughs) um because when we were talking about composition and you were showing the um the the landscape with the thing you you i remember you said it it you have to be dumb to do a good composition because it's like head bright light now we're looking at it and you mentioned uh-huh. here now that you you see the trend as going more subtle, because in the case yeah. of the, so it it how do you feel about that conflict, like making something that's dumb well, versus something that's subtle? Well, it only needs to be as dumb as any dummy can get it. So if if you were my test case, right, and you saw this, you know, any person, your mom, anyone, if you saw this and you didn't notice uh the the soldiers then uh then we're not putting the soldiers in your face enough Mm -hmm. right and that's all that matters that we can we can see the soldiers and get the feel and tell the story if you looked at uh if you looked at this one and the second you saw it you could tell that it was dead soldiers then they don't necessarily need to be high contrast they just need to be dumb enough that when any person looks at it they immediately know so that's what i meant by by mm-hmm. dumb so even though the other one had a very strong contrast because the contrast what was what was helping tell the story you can be subtle too as long as you're not too subtle as long as you're just right. enough that maybe right. you have this moody lighting that you want but still any person who looks at it gets it mm-hmm. now there is some mystery to this image still um it's not like if it's a devil monster and it's coming out of a volcano there's a lot of ways to go with it. We could do exploding lava coming from behind it, yes. right? We could do all kinds of awesome shit. Um, but what we're trying to do is say, if we were imagining this from a filmmaker's perspective, this moment in the film, it's not going to have all the things in the same moment. And because the 3D affords you to do so many different things, like like I could do multiple shots. Like we could probably do another close-up shot we were probably planning on another close-up shot where a guy is still alive, standing here looking up at it, and you can see that the devil's made of like hundreds of thousands of bodies. Oh wow! You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. That's yeah. Cool. But but we can't. But it's a fun idea. But we can't do it all at once. And so if we think like filmmakers, we can not make our concepts as over the top. We can make them a little more what we would call classy and dignified and cinematic, because. We have a lot of shots to get it done. So we could say we can use the same exact 3D, easily add another dude, and for not very much money, time-wise, when I say money, I mean time, we could frame up another shot with another character in here. So the way I'm seeing us moving forward as a studio is that we are going to start working more and more with game designers, with filmmakers, using all the processes that made Blender made Blender so fast and easy for concept art to not just get one concept, but to get tons of different ideas, make everything more cinematic. And we're not like spending all of our eggs on just this one image because we have the 3D. Mm. We could frame it up like a filmmaker. We could do a close up, a far shot, another one where we can see things better. And then we can do less each shot and make each shot more dignified. Mm. Mm. Got it. Got it. So it's, it's sort of a, it's yes. How dignified do you want to be? Right. You can go the obvious, exactly with the silhouette and like this is where you have to look this is the house that's it whereas you can go the subtle yeah. dignified route if it calls for it because you you could you could throw light on yes. these guys here like you had in the other one um but yes that would be a little too and actually obvious. and actually that well it might not be you know it's just like it's just to taste it's a season to taste yeah. so if i were to show that to a bunch of people and they were to say or even you were to say hey like i think that's maybe a little too subtle I don't like that as much. Mm, mm. Um, you, you might, that's that's a valid concern. So that's when you need your colleagues. I might send it to people or send it around and someone else might say, it's, it looks a little too dignified. Here's another example. Uh, when you look at the, when you look at the thing, when you look at the devil, the idea was that your face melts off. Like you die, right? You mm. just can't look at it because it's too horrible. So this was our first thought. Now that's cool, it's fine. And then I thought, okay, is the red too crazy? Is it too cartoony? Like if I was watching this movie, I think, and I was just thinking about it, not from the point of what's cool concept art, like choo 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 choo, but like if I was watching this film, what would immediately jump the shark and what would feel like uh, kind of cool? 
And if I was watching the film, I'd want you to die. But I'd when you looked at it. But I, but as soon as glowing red came out of your fucking eyes, I would be like, okay, well, this is it's a, cartoon. a cartoon. Yeah. <laughs> like I, yeah, I want this to be. Yeah, I want it to be super grounded. And as soon as you do glowing red, we're talking in the world of magic. And if we're going to sell the idea, if the if the premise of the story is that this thing, that Christianity was right. And but it, the devil doesn't look like what you thought it was. It's this giant lava, ridiculous beast, hell beast that if you look at it and you don't even see it in that shot most of the time. At the end, you might see it, and we're going to design what you, it looks like when it opens its face and you all die right. from looking at it. Yep, but yep. if that was our if 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 that was our premise, and it's supposed to be grounded and super based in like if we can connect it to Christian mythology as much as we can, or or Christianity would be cool. Um, and the, the lava works with the devil, then the red thing, why is it red glowing? So then yeah. we did another version. I asked the artist to just say, okay, it's not glowing. Let's try turning off the glow. Let's just see if we can do paint chipping. But then he still got these tendrils coming out of his face, and I'm not sure what those are as part of a human's biology, right? So if I saw that I would in, in a movie, I personally, this is just down to my taste, I really want to believe the magic. I want to believe the supernatural. So you have to feed it to me. Like mm. Paranormal Activity was like the scariest movie ever. Not because the guy like whipped out his schlong. He was just, it was all like super careful, super careful, mm. super subtle uh, the whole time. So when it came to this one, I thought maybe, but maybe we can even go more subtle where it's almost like a skin disease. It's something like you're like this, where your where your eyes are pustulating, your skin is getting really hollow, your teeth are turning black, your eyes are starting to bleed. Mm -hmm. The pustules that are around your eyes are things that are like naturally happening in a human body. They're just exaggerated or running in hyperdrive. Like your heart rate right. is almost, it's almost plausible that your heart rate is causing this. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't know that it's better. It might not be. Who knows? The filmmaker, the production designer, whoever's doing this, they'll decide. Yeah, yeah. But uh, it's just really but helpful concept to see because it's, it's like there's no right answer. Because like you could have an art, a, a yeah. director who wants the super cartoony like in your face. Maybe the uh, the the studio is they they need some good marketing, right? And they want it red, you know. But then somebody else might go yeah. for the super grounded, subtle, as you said. And there's no no right answer. It just depends what you're looking for. Well, the amazing thing about this is the only reason this is possible is because of 3D. Because each one of these took a few hours. Now, the reason you can pitch three a subtle idea is because the image can have subtleties. If we were drawing this, it would be impossible to sell the subtlety because there wouldn't be enough detail and nuance to sell the idea of pustules and blood. But now you know exactly what it's gonna look like. So if you can look at this and say, I want to zoom the camera in on his face, and I like that. It's creepy. Whereas this jumps the shark. Yeah, yeah. You can easily make that call as a director right, looking at it. Right. And it won't, you're, nothing is left to the imagination. And the 3D has made that possible. Actually, it reminds me of this awesome example that I found here. By the way, the, the, the artist must have to look at some pretty gruesome reference images. Skin diseases and <laughs> you, whatnot. Holy crap! You should imagine doing doing Last of Us, uh, Last of oh, Us uh, zombies. Yeah. It was all like skin diseases and stuff. Ew. Uh, this is an example I like that uh, Deke Ferrand and and uh, Patrice, who guys who did uh, Patrice is the production designer, did for Dune. Like this mm. is only sold. It's only sold in the nuance. Because you can't draw a toilet paper roll and show it to someone and be like, "Is this cool?" <laughs> like what? You know what That's I mean? That's very true. So the, yeah. 3D pro so the 3D process has changed so much because it allows you to sell uh, really nuanced ideas because when you show it to the person, the nuance is already in it. Whereas if it was just a sketch, I don't know how you do a quick sketch of this and, and, so and true, get anyone to be like, it looks good. That's a good point. I didn't even think of that. Yeah. It would, it would take way too long to show the nuance in Photoshop with something like that. Whereas like 3D, you can yeah yeah you can rough it or up, you can put some texture on it, repeat it, yeah. Yeah, and, and with like you know with there's obviously these masters. This is this is a way harder. This is Ralph McQuarrie from Star Wars. I mean, this is a, the skill to do this is outrageous. Like the ability to ability to acrylic paint and and and, yeah. and draw and render at this level in acrylic is is incredible. And I think 
with Star Wars, I mean, the designs are pretty simple and they didn't have any of these techniques. So that's a testament to George Lucas. Like the, the Star Destroyer is a giant cheese wedge, right? And it's very iconic and very simple and all the ships are iconic and simple, but that takes a lot of courage and it takes, um, it takes um, a dictatorship an absolute dictatorship. It takes someone who has a really clear vision. There aren't like five people that this has, this has to get approved by because it would just take one of them to be like, well, make it cooler, man. Like give it some stuff, yeah, you know? Yeah, you're right. Uh, you're it right. takes, um, and actually that that points to something else that I've noticed definitely in, in, in all the industry is that if you're gonna do something really unique or really over the top, uh, you really need the person at the top to have um, absolute power yeah yeah you're not, <laughs> like, you're not wrong there needs to be an auteur that that is kind of why like i i think a lot of my favorite films and maybe a lot of other people's favorite films are cases where it was it was a dictator you know it was it was somebody who was like nope you know that they've got enough chops you know like a quentin tarantino or a uh a, a lot of um god who's the guy who did interstellar his, his name's just blank Oh yeah, um, uh, what's his name? Chris Nolan. Okay, Chris Nolan. Yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah. Like where where you can, you know, a, a design or a choice is is like it's like you can tell the marketing team is like how we're we gonna market it. You know, it's like there's no mm -hmm. like big space scene. There's no battle. It's just like it's soft. There's organ music and it's in space. It's like how, but it's like yeah, yeah. It's it's when there's that that bold vision that could could fail, and probably most of them do. But um, but when it works, it, it really works. Yeah, June June. That's another very good. Yeah, story. and I think it, I think it's true. It's true because I worked for a lot of game companies, and like you know, Neil and Bruce created Last of Us. Uh, and when uh, when 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 uh, Neil was working on Last of Us Two, like he has, you know, Sony trusts Naughty Dog. They trust them. Infinity. They, and they don't, it's not, not all their first party studios, they don't trust the same as they trust Naughty Dog, but they really trust them. So anything they want to do, they get to do, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, I loved, like, loved the shit out of Last of Us 2. I loved everything about it. I loved the story. I loved anything anyone else hated. I That's the fucking thing I love the most about it. <laughs> so I liked the whole thing beginning. I liked the whole thing beginning to end. And I thought there was a lot of really extreme, bold, Besides, you know, the big thing, I mean, it's too late to not be spoiling, but besides some big story things, yeah. there was a lot of characters like Abby and Lev and um, these um, gay relationships and all kinds of stuff in it that that were really awesome to see and characters that I'd never seen like Abby, like this buff woman that fit that perfectly with the story. That was great. I totally agree. Yeah. And that, that that's a testament to storytelling driving the decision making, too. Uh, that's another power of story is that when you have a story that uh, you're basing something on, you have an equation you're trying to solve and anything that solves the equation is allowed. So you can't, you know, if you just had a buff Abby for no reason, it would just seem trite. But in a world that's the apocalypse with a girl who had, you know, childhood trauma, the fact that she would want to get tough, tough mm -hmm. enough that no one would ever want to fuck with her again. Yeah. In a world that is the apocalypse, it's so logical. In yeah. fact, it makes perfect sense. And we've never seen a character like that visually, a woman like that, depicted almost anywhere in any medium. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that was a really unique just decision, but based on some really strong story things. And that's exactly the same with concept art. Like, we're trying to make something subtle and cool, but we're trying to base it on some sort of story so we have logical reasons to do all the things we want to do. Mm -hmm. The bodies, the thing is a monster, right? But it's made of a bazillion bodies. Well, that's because it's the devil and he's getting them all up into him. That was a story reason that one of the most weird, bizarre things about it will come to light. If we didn't have that story reason, then it would have just been quote unquote concept art. And you know how concept art is? Concept art in the traditional sense is the guy with giant horns and pectorals with armor and 45 swords and like greebles on greebles on greebles. That's that shit, that old school concept art shit, that's concept art without story. Mm. With story, mm. then you have to think of like, why do they have this? And for what reason? And who are they? And, and, and ever since I got into concept art, that's always been what I thought was most interesting is concept art driven by story, games driven by story, stories driven by story. But without, because that's the human part. That's the part we connect with as people. Yes. Yeah. Totally agree. I, 
I um, we're coming up on two hours, but I I definitely want to hear your thoughts on a, a question that I like to pose uh, a lot of artists, which is, you know, a lot about concept art. If you had a young junior concept artist come to you, and they wanted to, uh, let's say, win an art competition, and they only had a year to train, what would and and you had time to like mentor or guide them or give them a curriculum. What would the training curriculum look like for a a, a junior artist? Um, let me see. Uh, I'll see here. Well, first I want to show you where I started out. Nice. All right, that's my art. Nice. Yeah, you like that? Wow. <laughs> this right here. Uh huh. This was a shark. This is Mario. Oh wow! This is this is your uh -huh. like. How old were you here? Oh, like seven or eight. Wow. Maybe? Nine. I feel like every, every every young uh, young the, guy in, of that age also drew these characters. Mario, Sonic. <laughs> Everyone was drawing him. But look at this Sonic. <laughs> but I made Sonic. But but he's cool. Sonic. He's got a skateboard and a cool hat. Oh yeah, that's cool. Uh, Look at this rainbow Lamborghini. Oh, it's like yeah. super sweet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, for anyone starting out, I would say, let me see. Right now, here's what I would say. Uh, eight. One of the best artists that draws. Because, you know, in that other thing I talked about, I'm going to see if I can find some plane crash. All right, so um, drawing is the hardest skill. Drawing is the most tough to come by. Drawing is the most difficult. I think if you only had one year, I think it would be great to, and I didn't say this in the concept art is dead thing because I was trying to focus on saying, okay, well, there's a lot of 3D techniques that are really important. And I assume that you already had a couple base skills, but I started out drawing. So I, you know, this is, and I started out in cartoony stylized drawing. So this was like a drawing I did of me and my girlfriend. Um, okay. Uh, and just us as animals, because I was thinking, uh, I really like, you know, Corey Loftus, who oh, designed yeah. the characters in Zootopia yeah. and uh, is is one of the best cartoony style artists. And it, it's so effortless. I'm trying to emulate him. So mm. what I would do is figure out what the thing is that you want to do that's the exact thing you want to do. So you want to work at Blizzard doing Riot, or, or Riot Games, you want to work at Naughty Dog, you want to work at whatever it is. I have always liked stylized animation style stuff, which is something not a lot of people know because I talk so much shit about, uh, you know, cheating and stuff. But drawing is definitely one of the most difficult things. But even me, if I want to get better, I'm like, okay, well, who's the best in the world that I've ever seen with my eyeballs? Okay, it's Corey. So at least in this style. So I'm trying to get my things to be as fresh and as loose as he is. And I'm trying to see, okay, what are all the things that there's there's like he's got even some like style guides little style guides here where he talks about how like legs move and how they bend mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and stuff like that um what i did is i thought that was cool but i also really like and here's some here's some other characters that i drew but i would draw them and then i would like look at what Corey did and then i would try to plus them a little bit i would try to stylize them even more like this guy on the right. Like I had drawn him and he's a little bit mushy and schlumpy. And I looked at enough Corey stuff and I'm like, no, I need to make him more skinny. I need to push the shapes a little bit more. I need to simplify this. I need to tweak the proportions. I saw, I think, Klaus and I noticed how his belt was a little bit higher up. So one of the most important things is that you're constantly learning from other people that you think are the best in the world at that thing. And because you have access to it, you go from there. So after I did that though, but I also love 3D. So after I did those, you know, I wanted to make, I want to make a 3D animated film. So um, I wanted to visualize it exactly how it would actually finally be. So I took those characters and then opened up this whole new fucking can of worms with Blender and with characters and with rigging. And, and it was an, a truly awful technical, uh, you know, nightmare mm -hmm. to go from someone who likes to only draw to someone who ha can execute, right? Because mm -hmm. it's a completely different brain and skill set. 
you know, and these two images I did, you know, in the process of kind of understanding Blender, learning it, learning the ropes, learning scatter, learning all the things. But you can see for me personally, it's always about telling a story because mm. that's what I care about. That's what I think is fun and interesting. And I want any characters that are in the scene to be uh, still have that cinematic lighting. So for me personally, it's always going to be even if it's animation, the lighting is going to be grounded. The materials are going to be somewhat grounded. Um, all of that stuff is going to be kind of realistic because that's what I like. That's mm. what I think is cool. Mm. So if I was someone starting out, um, I'll show one more. So this was another environment shot. This was another shot where I was kind of like, um, there, you know, I have a story for this. This is another animated feature that I'm working on a, on a pitch for. But um, I had uh, the environment for this and I had these two guys walking, but you, you, I couldn't tell too much story in the same shot. So I made another shot because I had the 3D where I just zoomed in mm. and tried really carefully for you to be able to tell exactly what the relationship between these two people are. Mm. And it comes down to their exact body language, to what they're wearing, to the fact that he's kind of the rough and tumble guy who looks into stuff. And this is clearly his boss who does everything by the book. And he's literally got a book and the book is between him and the guy because that's the way he separates himself. And mm -hmm. this guy's obviously covered in dirt, so he's the one who actually does the work, but his boss isn't listening. Like, there's a lot of things that I was trying to, story stuff that I was trying to get across. Mm -hmm. So for me, I would say, if you were to start, I would start with Eitan, who's actually been staying with me for, uh, he's in Prague here for a couple months, so he's like right outside. But uh, I think Eitan is probably, like one of the best concept artists in the in the design and juice department and he's got a bunch of videos on gumroad that are really, really good i didn't know he did that. uh that you okay. can watch yeah yeah he's got gumroad videos just type in gumroad and aton and i would start with his because he blocks out he shows you how he does this so if i was starting out i would say if you can do this right here this page if you can make black and white mock-ups that are part 3D and then part painted over. You remember earlier when I was doing that thing where it was like a grassy scene and then I did that quick scribble on top of it of what the character was? Yes. What, what, what I would do is do that, do the scribble to figure out the composition. And you have to do the scribble. And that's where the drawing comes in. Like you have to be able to move the pencil, the, the brush. You have to be able to make those shapes. Yes. You have to be able to like brushy brush paint. Uh, and then go back to 3D, change some stuff in 3D to match the scribble. Then go back to the scribble and see if anything needs to be adjusted. And sort of that handshake between the scribble and the 3D, that's the secret to like absolute master greatness. Mm. Um, because the people who are really good are good at 3D, sure, but they can very quickly... Let me see. I think he has like a, a little quick video demo of his, of his Gumroad thing here too. The really, really good people, they go back and forth between them. So let me see. Oh, yeah, this video. You can see him build it in 3D Coat, which is another program that's worth learning, mm -hmm. where you can sculpt things really quickly. And then he goes into Photoshop, and then he just quickly sort of adds the stuff. Another one, 3D Coat to, to Photoshop to painting, back and forth between painting shapes doing a lot of technical stuff to doing a bunch of artistic stuff. Mm. And that sort of back and forth is is really hard. I think it's I think you can still get a job if you can't do the painty part. Like it's I, I you know, I'd love to say, oh, you must have the painting skills or these really juice shape skills. You must have them. It'd be really awesome if you had them. But if you just had the the technical, um, it's a little easier to hire you because uh, because I can help move your composition around. You know what I mean? Mm. From an art director's perspective, it's a little bit easier to help someone who has the technical skill with some of the art skill because it's very fast and easy. Like, let's say their cloud shapes were not this nice. Well, I could help. I could do a quick paint over and say, make your cloud shapes like this, and we're moved on. Mm. You know? Mm. I, I think... I think I, you know, Finian said that he hires people that are like veterans, right, or people that have been have experience mm -hmm. or have industry experience. We don't do that. Okay. In fact, we make, like, we forge, we forge awesome artists. Uh, I mean, I think you're the veteran factory. You know, when I when I, t yes, I would say so. <laughs> I mean, I, I I mean I don't want I don't want to toot our our freaking horn, but like. 
when I see great concept art anywhere that I can't believe, even if it's from some other studio, I'm like, oh, it's one of our guys that did it. Uh, like they went there really? and did that. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, I think on, on like on like Last of Us Two, we had a dream team, and certainly I'm not taking credit for everybody's amazing shit. Like some people are. My job is to get out of their way. Mm. That's my job. Mm. And some people is is every day I'm pushing them harder. Mm. And so it's just you, it's season to taste. Like some people are such master leaders that they're incredible and they make everybody better and they help everyone. And that's what they do. And some people constantly need help forever. So my job was to just kind of go in and see who needs help. But I can look at a portfolio and I was talking to a client about this because he was like, where do you get your artists and stuff? And like, cause we have this team of like all industry veterans. I'm like, we don't have any industry veterans. They become veterans mm. by the time we're done with them, but they don't start off as veterans because we. I can look at a, someone's portfolio and they could have 20 shit paintings, but the last two are good. And I'm like, they arrived, they arrived. And the last two, they got it. And I can give them a job and I would say nine times out of 10, that person ends up being really fucking good. Like they get there, hmm. uh, and maybe one time out of ten, they, they they you know they maybe they can't quite put it together. They'll 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 stick around, but they never can take it to the next level. Hmm. Um, without maybe like an angry video, um, every once in a while I get like ahead of steam, and someone is not learning something for a while, and uh, there's a come to Jesus where I make them a video, <laughs> where I elevate I elevate my speech. <laughs> And I elevate my intensity. I do that as well. And uh, I'm like, come on. It's the, <laughs> yeah. Like a little bit. I told you this. And I, and I don't, don't do it do because. That. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not mad. I'm just elevating it so you know shit's getting real right now. Yeah. And it would be nice if, if we put it the fuck together because you didn't hear it the last bunch of times. And all you need to do is this one little thing. Because if you have a bunch of people that are technically good. All it takes to become a master is putting shit in the right spot. That's it. <laughs> Composition is just putting it in the right fucking spot. Like you already can make it. So it's not it's not that much to push people in that direction if they're willing if they're willing to go that way. I will say though, without the without the painting skill, that ability to make marks quickly and design shapes quickly, like Aton can do, then you're always a little bit limited because you're trapped by the 3D. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. the tr the 3D is an absolute prisoner because it's hard to move shit around. You can't experiment quickly, and it takes an incredible amount of balls to take that 3D. Take a screen grab of the render view. Don't even render it. Ain't nobody got time for that. Take a screenshot of the render view window. Take that into Photoshop and just start scribbling some new ideas about on top of it. It's it's so hard for people. It's so painful because you're taking something that looks polished and now you're shitting on top of it with the intent of making it better. It's it's so counterintuitive. Mm. Ninety percent of people can't do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But if you can do it, then you're gold. And if you are the kind of person that can get those juice shapes staying in 3D, which some people can, they don't need to go back and forth, and you're also golden. So I would say Aton Zana is the first stop. I would say uh, John Sweeney, if you want to, and this is assuming you want to do like uh, art station. John Sweeney also has some uh, tutorials that are great. And he was, of course, the art director at Naughty Dog, and he did this amazing shit. Mm. Um, so he, and he's also he a master G John of photo Sweeney, compositing. Uh, worked at, at One Pixel? No, he was the uh, he was the art director at Naughty Dog. I, oh, I mean, okay, okay. I was there at his graduating class. We helped him get a job there. Oh, okay. uh, me and Aton. Okay, he was still a stu He was still a student, but then when he got there, John is like um, is some kind of superhuman mm. because he's like the nicest guy in the world, and he's fiercely visionary in what he wants, and he's he's incredibly not a dick, and the amount of pressure that he's constantly under. The amount of like uh, how hard it was to finish Last of Us Two, like the the dedication that he went to, like he wasn't just an art director on high from his throne dictating. He was going in and like art directing, like the entire like going to every room and talking to the artists and being like the light need bounce needs to be more here, this needs to be more that. It's like super hands on. Oh, so sure. he was just that can get yeah. Tiresome. He was like I mean he's one yeah he's one of the main reasons I think that that game. Uh, right? looked so much better than any other game. Yeah, I mean, I would say, because he also has this, obviously, this extremely cinematic 
sensibility. So he's got some gum roads too. And uh, Jama. Yeah, he's got a, a whole. Um... Ju Jura. He's in the auto. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, exactly. But yeah, he's got so a bunch on Jama. Jama has gum road tutorials. And he's got a cl and he's got classes and stuff. And I would say like uh, Satish too. Satish is like uh, obviously he's newer to the game, uh, and he just started his school. But like uh, he was a concept artist, worked for us. But he started this thing called Art Train Academy. And I have to say, like all the teachers he's getting, like Leo Vieira, like one of our artists, and all kinds of Kevin Jig, all these great, great concept artists. Um, uh, I'm sure are gonna do killer classes, and his stuff is also really, really kick ass. Oh, wow. And he's he's, and he's really dedicated to teach. Yes, he's from India. Oh, that's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, and I think his wife is also a concept artist. Um, but uh, yeah, really, really passionate, really awesome dude too. So that's another great place to start. I would say those three would probably the, be the first thing. But I think what you need though is you need a colleague. You need a colleague who you trust, who's going to give you feedback. Mm. Uh, the guy, a lot of the guys that we work with, they get in touch with me. I might tell them a few sentences, but I'm busy. So the smart ones, what they'll do is they'll get in touch with an artist that I work with, and they'll and that person, like like any of our art directors or even just one of the artists we work with that are good that that they think are good, not someone who's like famously busy you know someone who's just like a working artist mm -hmm. who's really good who use the work you like you send them your stuff you get you give their feedback and one of them will get back to you especially if your work is getting there and especially if you seem like you're dedicated i mean i i, I was new to writing right i was getting into writing animated animated features and the way that i get help because it's a new profession and i'm not in school for it i took a screenwriting class and i read a book on it or two but, you know, the way that I get help on, like, my animatics is, um, you know, like, there was, a, there was a director that we did a job with. We did this pitch for a TV show that he's working on. It's Mark Andrews, and he's, he, was the, he was a director of Pixar. He directed Brave, co-directed Brave. And uh, we did a brief job with him. And uh, we didn't end up getting the job. We did, like, the little thing, but they hired somebody else instead. But I stayed in good contact with him. And, I, you know, we talked about, like, hey, if you need concept art, if I can help you with anything. And... And I knew that he was a director of Pixar, and I sent him, like, obviously we had some good art to show, but I also said, hey, I, could you get, have a look at my pitch, you know? And we already had, had a relationship from doing art together, and he was kind enough to take time out of his day to Zoom with me for an hour about my pitch. And just the other mm -hmm. week, I sent him, like, a, a short animatic, uh, you know? And a few weeks later, he's like, let's get on a Zoom. He gave me 30 minutes of his time to go through this animatic. So... The fact that I have, uh, you know, a Pixar director who's willing to give me 15, 20 minutes of his time is an incredible boon because he's like, you know, an amazing, amazing experienced director. And when he says it, it's true. Like for me, like anything he thinks I know is authoritative, but it can be anyone whose work you respect. In concept art, it's going to be even easier because it takes less time to critique concept art. You know, an artist who you respect can look at it and can give you feedback in like five minutes. They don't need to like read anything. Mm. They don't need to watch anything that true, takes time. True. They can give you feedback like instantaneously. So you must have, if you're not, if you're not in school, you must find a mentor and it could be multiple. Mm. I mean, for concept art, I give my work to Aton, who I just showed you, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and Lebr and Florent. Every single piece that I do goes to each one of them independently. Mm. And this is Florence stuff. Because they're the two best artists that I know who will return my emails. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is true. This is Florence. So, uh, you know, maybe I actually did some of the two best artists I know. Wow. I mean, thankfully, you know, this is the truth for you, too. You're, you're Andrew Price. Hey. When you ask someone to be on a podcast, <laughs> yes, they will say yes because you're Andrew Price. All right. Now, it's really cool to be you. Because when you ask to do a talk anywhere, like we were talking about, you're going to get it uh, because you've arrived at a certain point. So when you're starting out, you may not be at that point. Yeah. I luckily have so many concept artists who, and I also have a whole company. So I have a tiny advantage because if I ask a question on the Discord, I can make it mandatory to help me with Blender. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, I, like, 
Like, by the way, like, uh, just letting you know, it's just a question, but you got to fucking help me because I'm stuck with this bullshit and I don't know why. And, uh, you know, one of my art directors will, like, stop his day and make me, Leo will stop his day and really nicely, like, make me a video specifically helping me solve my problem. <laughs> that's so, nice. that's, so that's really sweet. That's really sweet. Yeah. But you don't necessarily need that. You can still just, like, connect with, uh, connect with literally the best artists that you can find mm. and uh, see if they get back to you. Sometimes people don't. Yeah. And or they're busy or they take a long time. Yeah. And then you need to find new people. You send yeah. it to five people. None of them need to know that you're sending it to a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. I I I, I definitely recommend that. Like, it, uh, yeah, because at at a, you, people listening, they're not going to be able to get Aton or or Florent to reply to their emails because they'll have you know twenty a day or something like that. But I think definitely finding a Discord can be helpful to get. Uh, there's a bunch that are out there for Blender. Um, there are even like ones where they're all trying to like uplift each other and like improve each other and give feedback. Um, but the, uh, what was I going to say? Uh, yeah, bas basically I, I think if you search out up and comers or people that are maybe not at the top, but sort of like midway or somewhere near the top, but you know that they're, they're not in the limelight, in the spotlight, that everyone's thinking of as like a household name, those people are going to be much more likely to reply. In my opinion, I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. And, and those people are, are plentiful. I know because I hire one every three weeks. <laughs> like there's right. so many, yeah, there's a lot. There's so many amazing artists out there that are not, uh, quote unquote famous. They, nobody knows their name. They didn't work on any big IP, yeah. but you can just look at their work and be like, well, that's great work. So you're great. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. I mean, there are, there are like 20 year olds that are better than 50 year olds. Mm. that have been working their entire lives in the profession, in my opinion. Yeah. And that's what makes our whole business possible. Yeah. Cause if that wasn't the case, then we wouldn't have a business because every veteran would be a veteran and every noob would be a noob and there yeah, would be no be crossover. No. Yeah, exactly. You know? Exactly. <laughs> And by the way, just going back to something you said earlier, um, we were talking about the, the skill sets you need. Because I've often tried to think about how you would break down the skills. And in my opinion, there's sort of there's three buckets of skills for an artist. There's the technical, there's the aesthetic, and then there's the creative. So the technical is yep. learning how to use a tool like Blender, whether what, what this light does, what you know, what's different between multiply and subtract, all that kind of shit. Um, and if it's drawing, it, that could also be, you know, perspective, uh, proportions, that kind of thing. Uh, and then you've got the aesthetic, which is your, what actually, like composition, uh, a, a pleasing light setup, uh, the, you know, complementary color schemes, that kind of stuff. And then finally the creative, which is really like narrative story, um, infusing different cultures into the art piece or making the story better or just trying completely weird things that shouldn't work and trying to make them work um i i kind of see those those three so what you were saying before would you say that the technical is the one that beginners should be focusing on um that's that's tough because i'm kind of uh uh it comes down to the business of concept art just a little bit okay uh let me see so the way i would say it is like okay so if when I'm talking about what I need, it's different than what you need as an artist doing your own thing. If I'm talking, you know, a lot of times I'm speaking from the perspective of what one would need to do to get hired at One Pixel Brush. And in that case, yes, Blender, environment artists, technical skill really high, because like I said, we can art direct the other skills a little bit more. If you're really technical and you can create 3D really fast and well and efficiently, and you're pretty good at composition and storytelling, but not the best, I can help you with the rest of it. But if you were someone who wanted to become like a story artist for Pixar, then you would need to focus on the story stuff and not the technical, um, mm. you know, kind of at all. True. But I would say there's two kinds of concept artists. There's concept artists that are inherently designers. Designers. And what I mean by that is like, they don't care about making pretty pictures. They care about designing the thing. You know, we worked with a concept artist for a while, Martin, who... He loves design. He doesn't necessarily care about making cool environment piece that looks sexy with lighting and rocks and stuff. Whereas Aton, on the other hand, is all about the pretty picture. 
He's not so concerned that the castle, all the crenellations work and are the right width for those kinds of archers of that time. And he's not concerned about like, he's not interested in like sci-fi ship design and where the jet packs go and how does it interact with its jump pod. Like there's so there's certain concept artists that are really into design and this could be buildings, cars, structures, anything like that. And then there's another kind that are that are into making pretty beautiful epic shots. So I think if you decide which one of those you are, then you can focus on the skills that you need for those. And for the environment pretty shots one, we need we generally get hired more to do that. And it's not because we can't do the other one because we absolutely can. It's just because when people hire an outsourcer, uh, it's a little bit easier to hire them to do the pretty shots and design the stuff in-house. Although that's changing a little bit. We're starting to really push on helping them with their design as well. But also that takes a lot more feedback loops, mm. whereas doing pretty shots is a little bit easier. So the nature of our business makes, you know, mon- like money shot, environment shots a little bit easier. Mm. But if you like the design part, then I would say you would learn how to draw, obviously, and come up with different shape ideas. You, I would definitely check in who your favorite designers are and the genre you want to design. Like if you like tech design you look at like aaron beck maybe or whoever the guys who did um you know uh metal gear solid whatever your favorite design aesthetic and try to design that way i also started seeing people design really well in gravity sketch or adobe medium Mm. which are vr 3d sculpting programs and those are great because the design is not too fussy you can't get too fussy with it because the it's a little clumsy but you can come up with a lot of different shapes and you can design things quickly in 3d Mm. so Mm. That's really powerful. Being able to design quickly in 3D is really good. So if you kind of figure out which one of those two lanes you like, um, that would be, I think that would be the best. And then if you are really into, the only way where I would throw away most of what I say is if you're really into doing like um, uh, like Riot Games splash art. Mm-hmm. Like that kind of thing, that Riot Games splash art style it really doesn't need 3D. It shouldn't have 3D. It's all about beautiful drawing and hand painting. And that's what it that and the reason I say that specifically because that's like a genre that has a lot of professional work needed. Mm. So you if you really like that style, then you might not need to learn 3D as much. You might be better with doing like um that th- going that direction, but I will say even for that, let me show one last thing here. Okay, so For us, and I was mentioning this sooner, even if we did a character like this that was really stylized, Mm -hmm. um, as soon as we were done with this, this is as far as we would render it. So I think in character design, people would tend to take this and then the next step after the the client approves it uh, is to start sort of polishing it up in Photoshop. But because ZBrush got so fast, we would go immediately from this to this. Mm. Right. Wow. So we wouldn't do a painting. We wouldn't do a painting phase. I, and I didn't know this was humanly possible. But once, and this is how it is with all 3D, as soon as this started taking less than two days, because that's how long this took, between, and it's all about hours, like we're counting the hours to the minute, because for us, we track and bill and everything in hours. And the reason is because when something suddenly takes less hours, then the whole game has changed. Mm. So it used to take, like if I were to ask someone to ZBrush sculpt this uh, five years ago, they would have told me, okay, yeah, I can do that in about two weeks. Okay, well, okay, well then we can't use it for concept art. We have to figure something else out. But as soon as this takes someone less than two days, well, now we're in business. Now I don't see any reason why we would paint this, especially if the character in the game is gonna be 3D Mm. like this. Mm because this is exactly what the final character is going to exactly look like. Yeah, exactly. Uh, now, if the character is going to be an animation or cell shaded style, then okay, let's do something else. But if the character is going to be 3D <coughs> in your game, then that's how we do this. So a lot of concept artists, also in the concept artist dead talk, there was like a, it was some complaints that it's soulless and you know it's like selling out and like there's no artistry to it anymore. Okay, our job, the way I see it, is to make the concept art look exactly like the finished product should. And that idea that it should look like concept art, it, art it doesn't compute. We're just we're trying to make it look like the final thing. So if we find a new technology or technique that can make it look exactly like what the end result should exactly look like in a fast amount of time, we're going to do that. Mm. And so, yeah, unless you're doing something that's supposed to be painterly. And and before Arcane, nothing had done that painterly style in in like awesome 3D before. Arcane was a complete game changer because that was like... That was like mind blowing. You're like, oh shit. 
Like, there's this painterly style that uh, Riot's been doing for a really long time, and they applied it. It's a little bit tweaked and, like, finessed, uh, but then they applied it to completely to 3D, real, like, you know, realistic emoting characters, and it and kind of grounded, too, and it felt fucking amazing and looked incredible. Mm. So, yeah, it was, it was really awesome to see that gap finally be bridged but yeah if someone was going to ask us to do an arcane style we would probably do this build it in 3d and then and then create the textures like you would for an arcane style or something that was more along those lines we would still kind of use this process to make it look exactly like the final thing Mm, got it got it interesting can't remember how we got on that tangent but that's uh that's a nice ending there um (laughs) cool so shaddy uh where, where, where can people find you and your business uh let's see here one pixel brush we're gonna have a new website soon but uh, we don't have it yet uh brush.com and instagram you know the instagram and uh and the twitter and all that awesome the instagram the twitter the facebook page instagram is where we get the most and you can also um our, our facebook page we post on all those things instagram is probably where the most people follow us but it has the smallest resolution so i would actually say art station right yep yep because at least ArtStation doesn't disrespect the art with its tiny, <laughs> tiny resolution. And disrespect it further by saying it's no longer going to prioritize uh, photos. It's going to be video only in the future. Really? Oh, you didn't know oh, that. did they say that? How oh, dare Insta- they? Yeah, there's like a big outrage. Oh, they said, no. we're not a photo sharing app anymore. They're basically competing with TikTok now. So it's oh. all reels and vertical video. Oh, shit. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, Shaddy. Glad to have you on the podcast. Awesome. Thanks. Great meeting you virtually. 